We want students to know that if they go to Kent State, they have the world a la carte as an opportunity for them to develop a true global perspective. Although she clearly isn't an atheist either because she says these words. Because this is how Christian movies always paint out atheists. They're like almost Christian. Because she goes, whatever's next has got to be better than this. Sorry, that's not atheist. (laughs) Atheists don't believe there's anything next by definition. Although nothing could be better than, you know, dying of leukemia. Yeah, there's a really dark atheist (laughs) interpretation of that. I look forward to the void. Werner Herzog is lying next to her in bed. (laughs) I gave her that line. (laughs) God awful movie. 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 Welcome back to God Awful Movies, where each week we watch another terrible movie so you don't have to. I'm your host, Keith Enright, and I'm joined by the Eli Bosnick. Eli, how's it going, buddy? Fantastic, Keith. Fantastic. Really? Mm-hmm. Okay. We're going to mess that right up. We also <laughs> have, not, I'm about to introduce Kara. That's not what I meant by that. The movie will mess this wow. up. Wow. <laughs> Do you guys want to work that out at the beginning of the podcast? Yeah, it's a positive. The, the, the next thing meant. is positive, and then the movie is negative. We also have, you already heard her, professional science communicator, soon to be doctor of doctor stuff of some sort, I'm pretty sure. And Medicine. most importantly, <laughs> begrudging religious movie expert, like serious expert, Kara Santa Maria is here. Kara, welcome back. Yeah, I'm here. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, begrudging. That's what I'm talking about. You are an expert, though, whether you like it or not. You know so much about this now. That's right. You're getting close to third place if you're not already there, Kara. I've got bad news for you. (laughs) So, Kara, why don't you just go ahead and tell us, what are we going to be breaking down today? So we watched Redemption Way. It is the story of a supreme narcissist who learns how to love herself more than she already did (laughs) because her atheist friend totally bummed her out by dying of leukemia. (laughs) (laughs) Like a bitch. Yeah. That's the movie. Yeah. And Eli, how bad was this movie? Well, if your ongoing quest to drive Cara Santa Maria insane has brought you to the Christian version of her literal medical practice over the last couple of years, <laughs> you will love this movie. That's... I'm just going to say it. If this doesn't break Cara, next time we have her on, it's just going to be her dad's politics on a voicemail <laughs> for an hour and 20 minutes. <laughs> Oh, Eli, I love how you refuse to admit that I'm not training to be a doctor. <laughs> is it not doctor? She's a doctor. It's I'm a doctor of some kind, right? Medical. It is a doctor of some kind. If you're not a doctor, not a medical doctor. why did I send you all those photos of my rashes? <laughs> doesn't even make sense. Exactly. It does. It does. Crazy. So <laughs> let's just have it be canon that it's doctor. And <laughs> is there anything y'all would like to nominate this movie for being the best at being the worst at? Yeah, I nominate it for being best worst protagonist because... Yes! Yeah, okay, that's an excellent pick. Yeah, the hero of this movie is a literal garbage person. The worst. We all agree on that, right? Yeah. Okay. A garbage person in like one of the most important roles a human being can have <laughs> for another human being. Uh-huh. Like until we watch the Christian movie about a pediatrician who like accidentally drops babies off the edge of the pediatric hospital... <laughs> this is going to be our best. Well, and we've accidentally, that would still, this would still be the, like, that would, that's an accident, right? <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> Purposeful because of their religion, right? So because the baby's an ammonite or something. God. Yeah. We, we've watched multiple movies about rapists, and this is definitely our best worst <laughs> protagonist. We've had Kevin Sorbo as a protagonist, David A.R. White. Yes, that is correct. So I was going to go with best worst racism scene for. Absolutely no reason. So oh, wow. there's no good reason oh, for this. Okay, so intense. There is so one intense. person of color in this entire movie. One. There's one. One. She plays one of the nurses at this hospice that we're gonna start talking about in a second. The main character is another nurse at this hospice, and they're both up for a promotion. <laughs> the white one ends up withdrawing. She she quits the job, so she's no no longer up for the promotion. So. 
this one person of color goes into the boss's office and is like, oh, okay, so the no, only other don't person. Don't spoil it. Don't spoil it. <laughs> it's so good. Is this don't this is important to the plot? So important to me that you don't spoil this. It is Oh come on. There's not a real plot to this movie. Everything's There's no important. plot to the movie. If there is a plot to this movie, it is resolved in this scene, and I've <laughs> never been happier. Okay, I won't tell you exactly exactly how the racism plays out, but that person of color goes into the office of the boss and is like, hey, so is that going to work out for me? And no, it will not. <laughs> then they'll explain why. And it's just well, like, and why would you do this? Why? Also, to mm. be fair, they they make her like the dumping ground for everything. Like, yes, what, they make her like nosy and loud and obnoxious and like nobody likes her. And like, why? She's actually a perfectly fine hardworking, nice woman. Yes, and objectively ethical according to the tiny little <laughs> plot that they do have. <laughs> yes. She's the only person who's like, no, that's like illegal, like medically unethical for you to <laughs> yeah. do this. You have to stop. That's her That's her entire role in the movie. Yeah, and that makes her the villain of the film. Yes, yep. of course, of course. And of course, I'm going to go with best worst MacGuffin. So Heath obviously just spoiled the greatest part of the movie, but perhaps... <laughs> Yeah. The second. Now the plot won't be exciting yeah, to anybody. I, you're probably going to skip this episode. You'll watch the, the iTunes thing where it tells us when people stop listening. It just stopped. But for those rare <laughs> few of you that stayed with the rest of the podcast, there will be a MacGuffin teased throughout this movie. And when I say that it is nonchalantly thrust into a literal coffin at the end of the film, I am not kidding you. What's a MacGuffin? That's like the object that everyone searches for. The, oh. the like a plot device that doesn't really have anything to do with the thing, but it moves the plot along. Oh, yeah. like every Christian movie we watch. Exactly. Yeah. Like okay. the br the briefcase in Pulp Fiction. That right? Yeah. Isn't that a, gotcha. That's like the classic gotcha. example gotcha. of a MacGuffin. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So yeah, it's the, uh, honestly there's like a couple different stupid MacGuffins, but obviously the one that literally goes into a casket. We'll get to it. <laughs> <laughs> so we're gonna take a quick break, and then we'll be back to tell you all about well all the plot of redemption way that I haven't already completely spoiled with that <laughs> tiny little piece I gave you. Yes. Hi, I'm Eli Bosnick. And I'm Heath Enright. As you know by now, in the past, we were always happy to have Kara Santa Maria on our podcast. That is until last week when we learned an unfortunate truth that we feel compelled to share with you. Hey guys, what are you up to? Kara Santa Maria of TV and podcast fame has old guy headphones. No, no I don't. She does. She really does. She looks like she's arranging mixes on a Prince CD in 1997. It's it's not a good look. I got these at the airport. They're fine. Mm. Please, Kara, you've already caused enough harm. It's time to talk about Raycon wireless earbuds. That's right. Wireless, as in not plugged into your Walkman with bass boost, like you're a background extra from an 80s movie. Raycon wireless earbuds are the best way to bring audio with you because no matter how much you shake things up, literally, no matter how much you shake, you know they won't fall out of your ears. Much like Kara's over-the-ear headphones, which is essentially like putting your head in a vice. You get used to it. Shh, you're embarrassing yourself. Raycons offer eight hours of playtime and a 32-hour battery life. And they're priced just right. You get quality audio at half the price of other premium audio brands. Right now, God Awful Movies listeners can get 15% off their Raycon order at buyraycon.com slash gam. That's buyraycon.com slash gam to save 50% on Raycons. Buyraycon.com slash gam. Don't shame yourself the way Cara Santa Maria has shamed herself. Can't even plug it into a phone. I have a dongle. Cara. <laughs> <laughs> Cara Santa Maria. Hi, Christian movie writer guys. What up? We are so glad you came in to help us work on this important movie. Oh, just so honored. Well, you know, you guys don't usually listen to me, but end of life and palliative care, they're really important to me. So I figured I'd give it a shot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Of course, of course. Yeah, and we want this movie to truly reflect how difficult that the Palpatine care really is. Pa palliative. Palliative. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. The dog guy. So I imagine the toughest part is not talking to someone about Jesus too much, right? I mean, I know I would like forget their pills because I was talking about Jesus oh, so all the time because I would be talking about Jesus constantly. Yeah, the pills would just slip my mind. No, not not even a little. Is that difficult? Oh, right. Because if you give them the medication, they're a lot more open to Jesus. So oh, smart, right. Kara. Yeah, totally makes sense. I'm just so glad we invited you in. This is good insight. Oh, God. 
Look, Christian movie writers, I cannot express this to you strongly enough. End-of-life care, including hospice and palliative support, are some of the most important and meaningful interventions a person can receive. A lot of the people who work in these fields are religious, too, but you absolutely cannot make a movie telling those people to proselytize. It's genuinely the most dangerous, evil, and psychologically destructive time to do it. Okay? You get it? Okay. Fine. Fine. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Really? Yeah. No, no, no. We'll, we'll put in a scene that you should only do it if you're really, really brave. Like a hero. Like a hero of Christianity brave. <sighs> I hate you guys. Like you're Jesus. Just like Jesus. I hate you so much. <laughs> <laughs> and we're back. And we're going to start this one off with some kids using their Easy Bake Oven. So that was nice to see. And... Their mom is on the phone with the insurance company about some very problematic movie-noma type cancer, I'm sure. Yeah. And can I just throw out there, none of this scene will ever matter, right? Nope. Like, they never call back to it. There's never a moment where it matters to the movie. They don't talk about it or think about it. It's just like footage they had lying around. But now I'm realizing, does that mean that this little girl has had leukemia since she was young? Ooh. Oh, right. His mom's on the phone talking about like doctor reimbursements for cancer. Oh, yeah. Okay. I right? guess this, and this is, is the a beginning. flashback to them as kids in the 80s. Yeah. I think this is, I think you're right. This, okay. This really ties the whole movie together and now it makes sense. <laughs> yeah. This, this nothing scene yeah. where they also run out to the pool and try to drown themselves for no reason. What did that, why, why was that part of it? I don't know. I didn't understand that part. Me neither. Very confusing. And they do try to call back to that. We'll get to it. It doesn't make any sense, but they try. No, we won't. We don't have to get to it. It's fun. <laughs> they do a swing and a miss on a callback later. We'll, yeah. we'll get to it perhaps. Or we'll swing and miss on it too because it doesn't fucking matter. Okay. <laughs> so it turns out that was all a flashback. Mm -hmm. Now we're in the present and we meet Jen, the main character, and her boyfriend Todd. They're playing cards and... They're not taking it seriously, and I already hated the movie. I was like, just take the, take the card seriously. It's a card game. Play for real. Oh. I thought at this point that this was going to be a horror movie because, like, <laughs> the white balance was really off and, like, the lighting was weird and the acting was really bad and he kind of seems like a murderer. Like, I think yep. he looks like a murderer. So I was like, ooh, yay, we're doing a horror movie. And then we're not no, at all. No, no, <laughs> no. I'm just saying we could create a coffee table book called Stuff They Have People in Christian Movies Do Instead of Fuck. And playing cards would be a good few chapters of it. And that would be kind of a horror book for me. Like, everything yeah. about it is terrifying. Especially, I was triggered by the not taking the cards seriously. <laughs> there's the whole, like, they do the air bud rules of cards. Like, there's no rule that says specifically in Go Fish you can't stare at somebody else's hand. Of course there is. Of course there is. That's a rule. <laughs> what would... Go Fish would be a vision test if there was That's not a, a game at that point. <laughs> Idiots. Yeah, but there is no rule in poker, for example, about looking at somebody's hand if they happen to flash it. That's part of the game. It's, uh, just take it seriously. Yeah, of course. Anyway, we learned that Jen is a nurse. In, in a second, we're going to learn it's a nurse at a hospice. But she's wearing scrubs and she's like, all right, I got to go to work. And this is a Christian movie. So we know for a fact she's definitely not a doctor because she's a Christian lady in a Christian movie. She's a nurse. That's what's happening. Why did they give her scrubs that are like three sizes too big? <laughs> They're very large. They, they look yeah. comfortable. So they're large and ill-fitting and black. And of course, her arch nemesis is wearing like really cute, fitted, not black scrubs. Like, right. was that intentional? <laughs> I wonder. She steals all the, there's a scene they cut where she steals all the good scrubs <laughs> <laughs> that come out of the machine. Typical atheist scrub stealer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Jen drives to work and this takes 25 minutes of the movie <laughs> it's for a while and then she pulls it she walks into a building for another 25 minutes it's so long yeah it, establishing shot is not the right word establishing shot for like an alzheimer's patient is what this movie goes <laughs> yeah. for they definitely have a hard time like finding the balance between when to cut scenes short and when to leave them long. Like earlier when they're playing cards, they're like, we have seven cameras. Check it out. One angle, one angle, one angle, one angle. And now they're like, ooh, we only have one camera today. So we're just going to follow her as she Did drives. you guys have a rabbit cam for Go Fish? What the fuck? <laughs> Use that for the other scenes. Yeah, it makes yeah. no sense. 
So yeah, she walks into a hospice office. This is where we learn she works at, you know, end of life care. That's her job. Right. And they did not get the strongest actress for this first patient. Oh. This person is supposed to be dying and in pain, and they went with rolling around and hocking a baluki. <laughs> yeah. That's the acting choice. She also is in like full makeup and looks fabulous. Like yeah, nothing no. about her. She's like <laughs> plump she has all this color in her cheeks she does she looks very very well she had a drag queen brunch to do right after this movie <laughs> she looks very not dying in this yeah. scene right for sure but jen's gonna establish herself as the villain right away when she explains to the friend or the mom or whoever that the patient's not in physical pain she's in spiritual pain Ugh, the worst yeah <laughs> she administers some kind of you know medicine that you might give to somebody at the end of their life to make them feel a little bit more comfortable. But then she says, God, give me the strength to help calm her. And I was like, yeah, fuck you. I wanted it to cut to God and God just being like, no, it's it, it's the morphine. I mean, like I helped you invent the morphine. It's just, just use the morphine. I invented that too. Yeah, she literally gives her Ativan. She's like, can I have some lorazepam, right? Some yep. anxiolytics. And gives her literally anti-anxiety medication. She puts it in her mouth and then she goes, God, give me the strength to heal her anxiety. Yeah. <laughs> I would like to see her use the Jesus without the anti-anxiety medication. This is prayer. Take it serious. And also part of her prayer is, and this is an exact quote, God, I know her discomfort is only temporary if she trusts in you. I wrote, what? That's an outright threat, motherfucker. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so from there, we cut to a church, of course, where Christian people are really excited about the, the nurse of death gig that Jenny has and they're talking to her about it. Yeah. They ask her about her job and she's like, I'm like a labor and delivery nurse. And I wrote in my notes, yeah, except for instead of life, it's the screaming empty void of death. Yep. <laughs> she says that. She's like, yeah, I deliver people, but, but into death, at, you know, so almost the same. So stupid. And then she gets a call from her mom and she, everybody in Christian movies doesn't know how to do the phone call acting thing. Oh my god, the acting in this movie is so bad, you guys. <laughs> yeah. So It's so bad. The call is that dad died. And on our side of the call, we hear like, what? Is dad okay? <laughs> yeah, no, no, Which honey. Which means that the other person was like, dad means not okay. <laughs> no, I just said dad died. Because you said what? As if I had just said, this conversation doesn't, it's crazy what you're saying. So dad's dead <laughs> is what happened. Yeah, even if the other side of the conversation was, hi, honey, it's about dad. Is dad okay is the dumbest possible. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, he's fine. This is your weekly check-in that your father's no, doing great. He's great. You know how I'm always like, it's about dad. And then I'm like, no, he's having a really good time with the crossword. He's, he did really well in the crossword day. No, it's never that. <laughs> Idiot. Dad's dead. Got a two on Wordle today. <laughs> <laughs> I did get a two on Wordle today. Anyway, so from there, we cut to Jen. She goes to her parents' house and her dad is dead. Mm -hmm. This is the wake. This is the weirdest scene. Yeah. This is like, so they're at, and clearly, are they at her parents' house or her mom's house? Because it seems like mom and dad didn't get along. So were they married? Yeah, it's, they're divorced. So this okay. is mom's house. Oh, are they divorced? Mm -hmm. Yeah, pretty sure they're okay. divorced. Mom's house. And they're skirting around. They never actually give you the story. They just talk about how dad's probably not resting in peace. Dad, <laughs> clear, like, there's an uncle character. Like, I think it's either dad's brother or it's mom's brother. It's hard to tell. And every time, it's hilarious. Every time they say something about, like, how dad died suddenly and they hope he's okay, he, like, rolls his eye. Yes. <laughs> yeah, she says, I can't stop thinking about where dad is right now. And again, this establishes the precedent that she assumes her dad is in hell, but we will never know why. Yeah, nope. never know. Never know. Which is something I would definitely want filled into my Christian movie. Right. Yeah. They're they're not good with the details in this movie. <laughs> like, all we know is that dad was like, he must have been a dick or something. But later in the film, not to spoil it, it they, they really talk about what a good guy he was. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> they do. Right? I was later when they say he was divorced, I was like, oh, okay, maybe he was like abusive or an alcoholic. No. No. no honestly, if at the end she had like just gently leaned down by her father's grave and it had a Jewish star on it, I would have been like, oh, uh, okay. Right. <laughs> I get what you're going. I did enjoy one other moment with that uncle guy because 
we walk up, we see him, and he's like, that was a great fucking funeral, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> she's like, yeah, I mean, my, my dad died. You, you can just, like, tone it down you a little bit. Oh, like, yeah, he was, he was 100%. He was like, he didn't even look dead in that casket. Super good sandwiches, too. He looked like he was straight up alive. <laughs> awesome. Love this. Sorry, sorry. This is uh, wrong tone. So <laughs> we meet that guy. He's fun. Then Jen walks outside, and this is where the plot really starts going. She sees her old friend from childhood named Autumn, who came to the, f- the funeral or the wake as well. Who, by the way, looks 100% healthy. Yep. Yeah, right. The, the movie's going to try and explain that later on in a single sentence. Oh. But they will fail. I must have missed that. Okay. She's supposed to be in late stage leukemia right now, to be clear. Mm-hmm. Yeah. She's not. Spoiler alert. God, he. Wow. <laughs> Didn't we already say this? No. <laughs> Maybe. But at this point in the movie, you don't know that. Yeah. <laughs> I am ruining this amazing <laughs> movie and all Film its tension plot, for you. Exactly. I apologize. Why don't you just tell him who Kaiser Soze is while you're at it? <laughs> now, here's the thing. This movie at this point is going for, it's awkward because they used to be friends, but they fell away because Jen found Jesus. What this movie finds is the sexual tension between Autumn and Jane <laughs> is thick. <laughs> T H I C. Only you think that. Oh my God, Eli. Kara, if you have friends who act like this around you, I've got bad news. They're in love with you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and at this point, they have to reference another plot point, which nobody cares about, but just makes Jen that much more awful. So Jen and her husband are thinking about having a baby or they're thinking about adopting. We don't know that yet. Jen is clearly not pregnant. And Autumn's like, did you have any luck getting pregnant? And she's (laughs) like, no, bitch. Look at how not pregnant I am. Yeah, (laughs) either you're really not showing or she's about to reach behind her and be like, yes, meet Mittens, my (laughs) three-year-old. Yeah. It's weird. Who I didn't bring to my father's funeral. Yeah, so they have their awkward conversation. We, We also learn that Autumn is single. And Jen, of course, is not, but she is, you know, she's trying to have a kid, but she she does have a husband, Todd. Autumn is single, and that's horribly embarrassing in this Christian movie universe. Autumn almost starts crying right after that fact comes up, because that fits. Well, it's actually not that. It's that Jen goes, well, don't worry, you've got plenty of time. Yeah, that's why she starts crying. All right. And she's like, yes, so much time, not dying, got to go to the... The not void. I I have to go to the hamster palace. Christian movie (laughs) universe. Dying means you go to heaven. Not having a a husband mate to take care of you means you're horrible. But she's not the Christian one. No, but remember, she's a dying atheist. She's an atheist. Right. So, okay, maybe she had a reasonable reason to start almost crying there. Fine. Yeah. Yeah. We go back inside now and mom's given the speech about. And I, I mean, the speech, I say, you shouldn't have to give a speech as a grieving spouse in my opinion but that's what she's doing well she doesn't she pawns it off on her grieving daughter (laughs) oh that's right she switches it over (laughs) i actually i always think it's weird when the spouse doesn't speak i'm always like really nothing yeah yeah yeah, but they're overwhelmed but also (laughs) mom clearly like hated him and is not the spouse she's the ex-spouse do you eli do you go to wakes and be like speak Speech. Speech. I, I, Speech. Who said that? Look, the point of marriage, like, I'm not saying the whole point of marriage, but one of the points of marriage <laughs> is that when you fucking die, someone who loved you for 40 years gets up and is like, hey, here's the song and dance. And then they're just like, oh, no, it's a little much for me. It's like, oh, I'm sorry, Sharon. Is it a little fucking much for you? Sorry for the 50 years we spent together. No, no, no. Don't inconvenience yourself here at the wake, Sharon. Just keep it all inside. <laughs> I'm sure I'll hear it from the fuck. Fucking void. <laughs> oh, Anna's going to have a speech. It's going to be like a tight 120, like a strong exactly, amount yeah. of material for sure. Damn right. Right. So, but yes, the speech does get pawned off on Jenny, the daughter, and she's going to say grace here. Right. Which will mm-hmm. accidentally meander into a meditation on whether or not her dad is in hell. Yeah. What the fuck? She starts out with like a, hey, God. Killed my dad. Good one. Got me. Got me good. <laughs> He's in a better place now. Or is he? <laughs> and the whole memorial service is like, boo. And she's like, nope, yep, nope, right. Wrong crowd. Wrong crowd. 
<laughs> oh yeah, mom gets a little miffed at that. Mom's like, yeah. not not the right place, hon. I hate him too, but we're not doing that here. <laughs> they never talk about it. He's somehow evil, but then that's negated at the end. Yeah, but they don't ever tell us why. Yeah, completely. I think this is like a Heaven's Gates, Hell's Flames kind of thing. Like he was a great guy. He just didn't ever tr- accept Jesus into his heart. Right. He wasn't Jesus-y oh, Jesus. enough. That the, I think that's all it was. Was that the musical we watched like a year ago? Yeah. God. Oh, uh, not a musical, no, not but a, a musical. stage play. Yeah, it's that horrible play where like a rapist says, I'm sorry, right before he dies. So he goes to heaven. And then like a school bus driver is like, I don't know. I have questions. So she like rots in hell. Yeah, they were all singing in my weird memory of that because it was a no, nightmare. They singing. You're okay. mixing it up with this other Apparently terrible musical singing. that Eli <laughs> made me watch. Okay, I th- I feel like we did a musical. It all runs together. Anyway, Jenny does the, the little grace thing and then she runs outside in a huff and she gets in a little fight with Todd here and she asks for the car keys to go take a walk. <laughs> yeah. Which was confusing to me. I wrote in my notes, give me the keys. I'm going to go street race. It's the only way I know how to mourn. <laughs> did the movie just forget how those things work? I think they did. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. They they forget about how a lot of things work. So that night, Jen and Todd are, well, they're having not sex in the bed together again. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're not mm-hmm. playing cards this time. They're just talking about eventually having kids. And I was like, yeah, that, that'll make it better. That'll make your sex life better. Go, go ahead and have some kids. Perfect. And they're having the every couple that should break up but won't conversation about having a baby. It's just like, oh, no, I want to have a baby. We just need we need to fully fund our 401ks before we have a family. <laughs> OK, but should you not be financially stable before you have kids? Isn't that like the what the good guy should be saying? And he's kind of like the bad guy in this moment. But also they live in a giant house. Right. Like, can we just take a second? Like, right, everybody in this movie lives in an enormous and comfortable and well-appointed home. Why are they not financially stable? They're not in, like, a crappy apartment. They're in a huge house. No, yeah. and as it turns out, it will be fine for her to quit her job in order to get the fucking yeah, <laughs> baby what's, later. What's happening? Like, what? where do these people live? Also, she's like, I can't wait any longer to adopt. She's I'm, I'm going to be like 23 in a week. I can't wait any longer. Yeah. Like, uh, <laughs> they're so young. Also, I don't think biological clocks apply to adoption, Jen. It's no. just weird. Oh, oh. And then he's talking about how we need money. And she's like, what about my Christmas bonus and the promotion? And then she's like, there are some grants we can apply for. <laughs> that was insane. <laughs> Is that a? Are there grants for being a? There are you, adoption grants. Is there yeah. like an essay contest for being a parent? And you get a fucking grant from somebody. What I did last summer with a baby I would have had. Yep. <laughs> the Rotary Club gives you a scholarship for your baby. I don't. That sounds Weird. insane. But it's so good. She's like, well, if I get my promotion at work, can we have a baby as a reward for me? <laughs> and he gives the most douchebag boyfriend answer of like, yeah. Um. Well, let's have my people. Talk to your people <laughs> and we'll, you know, we'll come back, circle back around, pin in that. Okay. But again, I think this is good. Like, you should have to get a fucking parent license. I like that should be a thing. People need to think through being parents more than they like. Or or we could get a decent social safety net. So like everybody who has a kid can support that kid, at least at a basic level. It's one or the other. We have neither right now. I don't like it. <laughs> Heath, every time you pontificate on politics, you end up at eugenics. I didn't. I I backed back away. I saw it coming. I saw myself stepping towards the line. (laughs) And then I was like, that's eugenics. Step back. Let's get the social safety net. Or, or. (laughs) I didn't want to say anything. Just sitting at a coffee table next to Charles Murray. What? (laughs) How did this guy get here? It's not eugenics. It was was money-based. I was saying only rich people should have it. But then I stepped back away from it, and I was not saying that. The most maligned intellectual of his time. I stopped. Just quietly sitting here. <laughs> okay, now we cut, yes. please, to something else. Kara just backs away from our brand slowly. <laughs> Goes back to being a dead people dentist. Oh, my God. <laughs> so we landed on social safety net is positive. The money thing is negative as a thing for getting, uh, you know, the right to have a kid. Hospice is a social safety net. There See? you go. Speaking of which, speaking of which, we cut to the next day. It is. It's a Medicare benefit. Did you guys know that? I did know that, actually. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You have experience with hospice. For sure. It's a six-month Medicare benefit that most people don't 
use, sadly. What happens if you only use like a month of it? Are you supposed to get like five free months of like morphine or whatever? How does that work, Karen? No, but yeah, if, you, if you're in hospice for a month and you die, that's what they're kind of banking on is that it'll be less than six months. But there are people who go into hospice thinking, you know, they have every indication that they have less time and then they realize that they're going to run out of hospice time. So they have to go off hospice. Oh. Yeah, like that has happened quite a bit. And then they go back on later. Cool. Yeah, it's like casino strategy. You have to play like a smart blackjack to to, to survive in our medical system. Yeah, because you <laughs> only get six months of hospice. You got to get double the hospice the next time. Then it pays no. for the hospice you gotta count, that you lost. You got to yeah. count the cards and bet big when it does make sense. And yeah. then you get all the more. <laughs> Fuck. Yeah. So that that's the big takeaway is we need a better... Social safety net. Uh, yeah, we but have, hospice is a great program. It's by great. The way. We need more. I'm, I'm we need everybody hospice. to be able to have all of that that they need for sure. Yeah, this is not funny because, and we're a comedy podcast, but literally the only doctor interaction people universally speak well of is hospice. Yeah, right. <laughs> Every other thing, if you're like dentist, someone will tweet at you and be like, my dentist ripped out all my teeth and sold them to Adolf Hitler. And you're like, oh, God. <laughs> but everyone's just like, no, the dying people are great. They give you these big ass horse pills that make you They're see delicious. grandma. Yes, and they then are. You head out the door into the scream. Yep. Except, by the way, New Hope Hospice, the hospice where Jenny works, is weird it is yeah. horrible it's got five whole employees <laughs> and two of them are nurses and they manage every dying person in this like mid-level suburban town yeah so we're cutting to that right and this is where we're going to meet our villain right <laughs> oh, this is no. the, the only wo- person of color in the movie she's a lady and we're introduced to her by her being like oh this patient was just like help me help me help me i'm in terrible pain dying people <laughs> am i right and then Jenny's like really mean to her. Yeah. Like you notice how mean Jenny is to the only black woman in the whole movie. Right. Okay. Here's the thing. This movie is so cluelessly racist that they did not realize that by making their only black character the villain of the movie, they make everyone else in the movie a vicious racist. And it is hilariously funny. Like, I feel like they were watching this with that actress and she turned to them at the end of the dailies and was like, Guys, are you worried that anyone's going to think it's weird that I, the only black woman in this movie, am the villain and you're all just (laughs) cruel to me for no reason? And they were like, what? Yeah. I think they were genuinely like, no, that wouldn't be weird. (laughs) Yeah, I think they were like, yeah, that's the point. (laughs) This isn't a dog whistle. This is a whistle. (laughs) Do you hear it? A nice, loud whistle. We're racist because we don't like you. Yeah. Yeah. But she's going to ask her boss for a raise. And she does that by... uh, Walking into the boss's office and um, picking up the picture of her family off her desk and staring at it. <laughs> <laughs> to, to be clear, the boss has a, a framed picture of her family and Jen comes into her office, sits down, reaches over the desk, grabs the picture of her boss's family and just is like, so, yeah, anyways. Did you notice, too, that there was like a violin concerto that was weirdly playing very loudly, then it went away like... I think it was like an AD's ringtone and they just didn't take it out. <laughs> yeah. Like it was the weirdest thing. That. Definitely live phone on set for sure. <laughs> <laughs> right. So I guess the whole point of the scene is for us to learn that Jenny's trying to get a promotion, right? She's right. trying to become like the assistant director of the hospice or something like that. Right. She wants to be senior hospicipal or whatever. Like that. Yes. And, and she wants that and she doesn't want the only black woman in the movie to have it. Right. Specifically also that. No, good point. This is very important. So now they're about to have a staff meeting and Jenny's talking with this coworker, the one person of color in the movie. And uh, her name's Marilyn, by the way. We don't learn that yet, but Marilyn is the name of the coworker. You're so good at knowing every character's name. Yeah. (laughs) You always like, you always do that in the notes. You like put them in parentheses. It's very helpful because I just give them all like weird pet names. Yeah. The movie doesn't fucking put them in parentheses or in like (laughs) audible noises in a movie, their name. No, this is Marilyn. And Marilyn is like, oh, thanks for letting me know about that promotion. Because when they were talking a second ago, Jenny mentioned it. Now Marilyn's going for the promotion too. And she's evil because of that somehow. Right, like just because she wants to also have, I don't know, more money and more responsibility at work, which she clearly earned, and is clearly very senior to Jenny, somehow that makes her a conniving bitch. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, they act in this movie as though Marilyn wants to steal Jenny's adoptive baby, right? Like she's <laughs> yeah. like, no, I overheard you talking. I think I'm going to get me one of those adoption babies. That sounds fun. <laughs> <laughs> so the boss starts the meeting and is like, okay, we have three new patients in my folder here. Jenny, you'll take the first one. And she hands out the paper and it turns out it's Autumn, her dun, dun, best dun. childhood friend who has late stage leukemia. So at this point, just to be clear, because I know that Heath spoiled it for us like 900 times. Thank you. This is the first point in the movie where you're supposed to know that Autumn is dying. Yes. You said leukemia in the way it's the story of thing at the beginning. We all And spoiled. he didn't send the text. Yeah, yeah, he meant yeah, to yeah, send yeah, the text. Yeah, and yeah, and, yeah, and yeah, Eli's yeah, clearly gaslighting right now. <laughs> a liar about it. <laughs> Kara, I have a question because you are a dead people dentist. <laughs> feel like this is not how hospice works, right? I don't think they hand people out like fucking baseball cards. They're just like, all right, you get grandpa dying, you get grandma cancer, and here, you you take the young one. All right, we'll th- hands in the middle, everybody. Hospice on three. Okay, so I'm just going to make one thing abundantly <laughs> clear right now so I don't have to do it anymore during the show. Just answer the question. Kara. I am training to be a clinical psychologist. I'm in my last year of my PhD program. I work Feels in a up. cancer center as a psycho on Oncologist. I do therapy with people who have cancer. Some of them are v- doing very, very well. Some of them, unfortunately, are dying. I do not work in hospice. I have worked with people mm-hmm. who work in mm-hmm. hospice, but I don't know what these internal meetings are like. In Death hospice. dentist. Got it. Yeah. Because I don't work in hospice. Also, I'm not a medical doctor, nor am I a nurse, nor am I a dentist. <laughs> So I don't know, Eli. I don't know if that's how these meetings go, but you're well, right. you're a science communicator. Maybe you could communicate the science to me. They probably don't go that way. You are correct. Have you ever done a one, two, three break hands in thing with uh, clinical psychologists? Do you ever do that with the cancer that you psychoanalyze? <laughs> with the, the cancer stuff. <laughs> that's what I do. I, I psychoanalyze. Cancer. Yes. You do. You're talking to the. They just. And now I'm picturing a big tumor lying on the couch in front of you, being <laughs> of like, "I not. just really want to kill Harvey Weinstein." <laughs> oh my god. Okay. Now I'm picturing that too. Nice. But like, never like one, two, three chemo or like anything. Well, no. But I will tell you one thing that for sure doesn't happen. So I'm going to skip ahead here. Whatever, whatever context exposition. So basically, <laughs> she gets the folder that has her her best friend, ex-best friend Autumn in it, and she starts crying and everybody goes, oh God, clearly you're not going to be her nurse. That would be a conflict of interest. And so we'll give it to Marilyn. Okay, great. Well, I'm still going to go visit Autumn. Uh, by the way, also this entire movie watches like a corporate anti-harassment video. Like it's that quality. It sure does. <laughs> <laughs> like it's it's rough. Yeah. So Jenny, you know, gets the envelope that shows that it's her best friend Autumn that's dying and she starts to basically have a panic attack. And this is a apparently an office full of medical professionals. And the head of the office runs up to her and like waterboards her. <laughs> She makes her chug the bottle of water. It is literally the drink the milk meme, right? Like I consider me and Kara to be very close. And if if we were a little bit closer, I would have inserted the drink the milk <laughs> meme into our notes. But we watch the drink the milk meme happen in real time from her boss to Jenny. Very it's unpleasant. super weird. She's having an active panic attack and they're like, drink, drink, drink. And she's like, oh, 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 oh. I don't know what to do. I'm much less panicky now. This is great. Thank you. <laughs> this is good. Thank you. Now that I've drowned a little bit, I'm much calmer. I'm very drowned and relaxed. That's great. That's great stuff. And by the way, she takes this, this I guess, thing she learned from her boss <laughs> to Autumn later and waterboards her when she's having yes, a panic yep. attack. Sure does. Mm-hmm. Sure does. And, and, and. So, it's always the waterboarded who waterboard. So, <laughs> Yikes. So Jenny goes home for the day after that meeting and Todd comes in and he finds her laying in a pile of paper that she had created. She angrily tore out the pages of her grieving pamphlet because she was mad and he's like, hey, did you, did you make a blanket of paper for yourself there? And she tells Todd that Autumn is in hospice. Oh, she legit goes home and reads her the pamphlet that her own hospice writes about grief as if she's never seen it before. She's like, this now applies to me. And then she opens it up and it's like heavily annotated. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like she's studying for an exam? Yeah, exactly. Part's weird. Remember, do not the stages of grief, right? 
<laughs> she so has like weird. flashcards stuffed into it. And then she looks to the sky and she does a, why is this happening to me? And I was like, yes, your friend dying of cancer <laughs> seems really hard on you, Jen. Oh, and this is the first of many times when it's very about Jenny. This uh-huh. whole thing that's happening in this movie is very happening to her. It's gross. She's having a really tough time with somebody else's leukemia. Yeah, it's, it's tough for her. Uh-huh. And then uh, her and Todd have a very like creepy, silent, almost silent Protestant dinner together with the yes. clicking <laughs> knives and forks, which was fun for me. I wrote, they're having quiet non-Jewish dinner. <laughs> oh, and there he's like, it's like amplified though when he like drinks out of his water glass with his creepy murder mouth. <laughs> Like all you can hear, like oh yeah, mouth noises. It's so gross. Yeah, and so this is where she explains to Todd her theory on what's happening here universally. She says, basically, she says, I think God gave leukemia to Autumn to teach me a lesson about religion and how important it is for me to take it seriously. Mm-hmm. And for that reason, she's going to go see Autumn. Right. And his response, by the way, is. Was for dessert. (laughs) That's a valid response. Hey, look, these two deserve each other. Every time this guy's a douchebag in the movie, I remember that he is with Jen and I'm just like, oh man, this guy. No, again, I approve. I approve that putting Guy and Jen really do belong together. He's a terrible mate, but she's like evil. So, you know, yeah, yeah, fair enough. Yeah, they're perfect for each other. And then before he leaves, he gives her the Christian movie forehead kiss. I wrote in my notes, whoa, whoa, whoa. Kids could be watching. (laughs) (laughs) So, yeah, she leaves to go deal with Autumn, but really deal with herself and, you know, be awesome at religion because that's the point of all this. So, you know, everybody's. Yeah, everybody's always dwelling on the downside of leukemia is, is I feel like what they're going for here. But. You know, how how much easier does preaching get when your target can't really move? And that's a positive, right? Silver lining. So we're going to take a quick break and think about all the pros and cons of leukemia. And then we'll be back with more Redemption Way. Well, you can't see his duck penis. That's why he doesn't need to wear pants. Okay, but do the other characters know that? Mm. Okay, which one of you stole my purse? Ah, 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 Kara, this is not your purse anymore. Now it's our grumble bag. Exactly. Your what? Our grumble bag. Whenever one of us is feeling down, we just grumble into our grumble bag and uh, we're all better. And does that actually work? No, definitely not. Actually, it doesn't work at all. Well, have you guys considered therapy? (laughs) Therapy? Okay. I'm not crazy. No. Yeah. And who has the time? And the money? No, absolutely not. Exactly. We didn't all save a bunch of money by buying headphones that were unpopular in 1994, (laughs) Kara. All right. Well, then why don't you try BetterHelp? Oh, what's better help? Better help is customized online therapy that offers a video phone and even live chat sessions with your therapist. So you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. It's incredibly affordable and financial aid is available. Plus, God Awful Movies listeners get 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash awful. That's a B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash awful. Okay, that does sound better than the grumble bag, which doesn't work at all. Yeah, it does. Okay, Kara, we're in. So can I have my purse back now? Ah, careful, don't open it. These are marshmallows. Sometimes you want a marshmallow while you grumble, Kara. I see. Reasonable. You don't? (laughs) Hey, babe, what's the matter? It's Autumn. She's, She's dying of cancer. Oh, babe. I'm like, so sorry to hear that. Sorry, one second. That's my hot pocket. I know. And and she and I haven't been close these last couple of years. It, it's just... Sorry, that- babe. I can't hear you. Hot pocket. One second. Okay. Okay. I'm back. And go. Yeah, I was just saying, I, I know we haven't been close, but, but late... Is that another hot pocket? No, no, it needed like 10 more seconds. One second. The point is, I worry about her immortal soul. I hear you, babe. Almost there. All right, I am back. I've got my hot pocket. I am ready to listen to you. Go. It's, I'm just worried that if I don't talk to her about it now, I'm never going to get the chance. Talk to her about what? A threesome? No, her soul, her immortal soul. Right, soul. Yes, of course. So painful. 
Yeah, it really is. No, I was talking about my hot pocket. It's like super hot right now. <sighs> okay. Should have done five seconds. And we're back. And the protagonist of the movie is driving over to her friend's house to change the religion of that person, her, again, dying friend. That is the mm-hmm. plot mm-hmm. right now. Whole plot. And there's a tiny moment here that I have to talk about because it literally never fucking matters and it's so bizarre. She gets a voicemail from her pastor being like, Hey, Jen, it's me, your pastor. I exist. Goodbye. He will never be in the movie again. I have no idea what this pastor donated on Kickstarter. (laughs) Oh, no. That is this actor being like, oh, Greg Luck left me a voicemail. He's my real pastor, Greg, because it says Pastor Greg on the phone. (laughs) And Greg Luck would leave a voicemail like a sociopath. Who leaves a fucking voicemail? That's terrifying. Anyway, she goes to visit her dying friend, and takes out a goddamn Bible and is like, I'm going to read the Bible to you, dying person who is stuck in bed and can't really do anything about it. And on the way, she we have to watch her put on her hospice mascara. Yep. That was weird. What's <laughs> like, not sure why that happened. Is there an appropriate makeup situation for helping dying people? Well, only if they know that later they're going to make you cry on camera. So they want you to look like Tammy <laughs> Faye, I guess. Got it. Got yeah, it. Yeah, you got to get that, that Tammy Faye cry going on. And... They're having, again, they're having this like, oh, will I or won't I go and tell my friend about Jesus moment? But the mom opens the door and is like, hey, are you just hanging out on my porch? And she's like, no, no, I'm I'm here to visit Autumn. Here to visit. <laughs> I didn't panic Autumn. and then try to leave and then you caught me doing that. And now, yeah, <laughs> I'll come inside. Also, Autumn's mom is weirdly Southern. I have a hard time with this. <laughs> I don't know why I'm having such a hard time with this, but they live in generic America, USA. Mm-hmm. And both Autumn and Jen have generic America, USA accents. But Autumn's mom talks like this Mm -hmm. and Jen's mom (laughs) all talks like this. Yeah. And I don't understand how they're both from such very different parts of the country, but weirdly they grew up together. Texishigan or something. Yeah. 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 Autumn's mom is also way too chipper when she finds Jen. She's like, Oh my gosh, are you Autumn's nurse? Have fun. Yeah, it is weird. You'll be there when she finally slips into the dark. Oh gosh. I have to get a picture of that. That happens multiple times. You're right. Will you like, breathe in her last breath out? <laughs> <laughs> like, like, not only does Autumn's mom say that, but later when she sees Autumn, Autumn's like, are you my hospice nurse? Yeah. Like, no. No. That's weird. No. <laughs> she can't do that. But she also says that, like, no, apparently that's a conflict of interest. Yeah. Meh. Like, they think I might proselytize to you or something. <laughs> is that a Bible? No, this is a medical book. It's science Bible. Lithium. Yep. (laughs) So Jenny goes upstairs to literally proselytize to Autumn, who is dying. And uh, Autumn's got the typical uh, Christian movie cancer scarf of cancer, I guess. Yep. And Kara, again, you are an oncologist. So (laughs) clarify for us here. The first rule of cancer is that you never let them give you a headscarf. That's what kills you, right? Oh, no, it's the headscarf. <laughs> well, here's the part that I don't get. And maybe you were saying there's a one-liner somewhere in this. I feel like Jenny's dad just died because multiple times when she's at work, they're like, are you okay? Do you need bereavement time? And she's like, no, I'm cool. I'm just going to keep working through this. Yet, you know, and Autumn came to the wake and looked so healthy. Yes. And then like a day later, Jenny goes to visit Autumn at her house and she's weeks away from death. She's yeah. gaunt. She has cachexia. She has all the telltale signs. Like, and it makes no sense. Yeah. She says, oh my gosh, you looked so good at dad's service. And she's like, oh yeah, I rarely get out the wig anymore. And it's like, I feel like it's more than just a wig. It there. was definitely <laughs> like, she like lost 30 pounds in two days. Like it's bananas. That's why they tried to explain it because she was wearing a wig. I guess. Oh, my God. And this is also an incredibly important moment in the movie where she asks her for the first of, I'm going to say genuinely 50 times, how are you feeling? Yeah. I'm fucking great. I'm great. Thanks. It's awesome. I love this. Stop asking dying people how they're feeling. They're dying. They feel bad. They either feel bad or high all the time until they're dead. That's the answer. And it's it's also like the first of several times when it's very clear that it's all about Jenny and what Jenny wants and Jenny getting what she needs out of these situations. Like, A, she shows up unannounced to Autumn's house and uninvited. 
Mom just lets her in and doesn't warn. She doesn't say, Autumn, you have a visitor. Are you up for a visitor? She just goes, go on up. Surprise her. That's fun. (sighs) And then she walks up to Autumn, who's clearly in a lot of physical pain, and she forces a hug on her. Yep. She like goes in and almost lifts her body out of the bed and squeezes her. And she like winces. Mm -hmm. What the fuck? Yep. And then she asks her, how are you doing spiritually? Which, hey, praise to Autumn here. Autumn's answer to how are you doing spiritually is, oh, I like science. That's dumb. (laughs) Yeah, she's awesome. You're dumb. I'm dying. Although she clearly isn't an atheist either because she says these words. Because this is how Christian movies always paint out atheists. They're like, almost Christian because she goes whatever's next has got to be better than this sorry that's not atheist (laughs) atheists don't believe there's anything next by definition although nothing could be better than you know dying of leukemia yeah there's a really dark atheist (laughs) interpretation of that I look forward to the void Werner Herzog is lying next to her in bed (laughs) I gave her that line (laughs) can't help notice you didn't give me a hug when you came in oh I was in Jack Reacher too. <laughs> this whole fucking scene. All I'm rooting for here is a person with leukemia just beating up a Christian lady and throwing <laughs> yeah, her out of the window sure. somehow. Because she's also, she's literally, this is the first of many scenes where she guilts her. She's, Jenny's talking to Autumn, who's clearly in a lot of pain. And she's going like, I don't understand what happened to our friendship. Why didn't you ever return my calls? Yes. Why were you such a shitty friend to me? All I tried to do was teach you about Jesus and you never let me in and now you're dying. How dare you do that to me? Yep. Yep. This is about me. Yeah. And again, Autumn is so great here because she's like, I just really want to know what happened between us. And Autumn's like, I'd love some pudding. Do you know where I could get Do you some really pudding? want me to explain how you're the worst? You're Christian <laughs> yeah. and you're the literal worst. Like right now, you're okay. It seems like you're about to hand me death homework. That Bible, you're gonna is that was that what you're doing? Yes, that's what's happening. Yeah, you're the worst. Is why. Oh, and she literally says the words. She goes, "Humor me." Like, oh yeah, because yeah. she totally owes you that. What the fuck? Take the Bible. I, I wrote in my notes. How else are you gonna know which babies to kill on what rocks? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but this is what the bad guy, the African-American woman, sees her doing, which, again, is completely immoral and I think might be illegal. She's just, like, shoving this Bible into this dying woman's hand, but Marilyn sees that. And so Marilyn very rightly comes in and is like, hi, I'm your actual hospice nurse. Hey, Jenny, do you want to leave now? And Jenny's like, oh, I was just getting to the good. Okay, I'll, I'll see you later. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so Jenny, Jenny goes back home. And she starts talking to Todd and she explains that Autumn oh God. is definitely dying soon. But, you know, she did super good in her Christian thing, which is really the important takeaway of all that. Right. Yeah. This this scene starts with Todd turning to Jenny and going, how is she? And Jenny going, not good. She's dying. And Todd goes, well, does she believe in God? Oh, <laughs> the worst. Don't worry, babe, because she can like get a boyfriend in heaven or whatever. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and then oh, and then she says, "I don't want to make the same mistake I did with my dad, aka proselytize until he hated me." Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> like that's just the plot of this movie is her worried that she's going to push Autumn away just like she pushed her dad away, and then won't be able. Then she'll be all regretful in the end. It's like then don't do it, don't do it, Jenny. Yeah, why do you have to be so garbage? The worst. And so I think this is where the editor of the movie was like, "This is the fucking." most horrible movie I've ever goddamn seen. (laughs) I'm going to just insert some stuff. It's going to be super boring, but it's going to be better than this. Nothing is better than dying of leukemia. So now he puts in, we get like 45 minutes of looking at a night sky and then we watch (laughs) Jenny drive a car into a goddamn strip mall in the suburb. It's like the most boring possible things. We watch her push a cart around a supermarket yep, for a while. We watch her, oh, I love the we watch her grocery scene. shop. So Eli, I have a question because at one yeah. point as she's grocery shopping, she passes a woman who has a cart or sorry, a, a basket on one arm with a child, like a toddler mm-hmm. that she's holding hand. And then in the other hand, she's bottle feeding a baby while she walks around the grocery store. Fuck yeah, she is. Do you feed your child like in route? Like, oh, is this what you do? That feels My child? Absolutely. Are you kidding? <laughs> it's that so like weird. take a grape policy, I abuse the hell out of the take a grape. Look, 
There's two things my son loves. It's the same truck book over and over again and berries. And when we get to the grocery <laughs> store, he is a stochastic terrorist of the rule of you're allowed to have a berry or two from the grocery store. He's just dumping pints into his mouth full hog, slamming them on the ground like Thor. It's causing other people to commit acts of terrorism? Yes. But when by he- doing that? <laughs> Okay. By his Not words? really what I was asking. <laughs> what I was really curious about is that when he was so small that he was either bottle fed or breast fed, did you not sit down to feed him or did you just keep shopping yeah. the whole yeah. time you were feeding him? Good, yeah. Good clarification of the question. This is a great clarification. Yeah. I, <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know that we ever did a bottle on the... Actually, you know what? We did bottles on the go. This, <laughs> I love that. I don't know if you've seen early footage of my son's cheeks, but there were bottles pretty much universally for that first year. <laughs> okay. Well, that's important. Important that that got cleared up. Good. Yeah. It's an important scene to me, at least. I don't know. <laughs> so they get through this nonsense, just edited in boring stuff. And then back at home, Jenny's making food to bring to Autumn. Oh, yeah. And Todd walks in to be the literal worst. Oh, my God. This is my favorite scene. This is my favorite scene. (laughs) He's like, oh, what are you making for us? And she's like, oh, no, I'm I'm bringing them over to Autumn, who's dying. And he's like, okay, well, will you make me a DiGiorno pizza before you go? God. Yeah, he's literally like, I want some of those potatoes. She's like, no, I'm making literally boiled, tasteless potatoes for my friend because it's the only thing she can eat. And he's like, well, God. What am I supposed to eat? He just, he just grabs a potato out of the boiling water and burns himself. <laughs> oh, oh, but at least Autumn doesn't have this. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> and so Jenny's literally like, dude, there's a frozen pizza in the freezer. You can cook it yourself and just do me a favor and please do the dishes. Like I'm okay, stressed. But it's, I'm it's, doing too much in my life. It's even worse dishes. than that. It is worse than She's that. She's like, I put a pizza in the oven for <laughs> oh, you from right. the goddamn freezer because you wouldn't be able to handle that. Yes. <laughs> There's a DiGiorno on the way. I set a timer. When it, when you hear a little bingy noise, then you just pull your food out of the fucking food box of heat and then you eat it eventually. And just wash the dishes. Yeah. If you could just please do the dishes. That's all I want from you. Just do the dishes. And by the way they're couple dishes not cooking dishes she's talking about like two plates and a fork that she's asking yeah. him to do yeah. yeah 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 right but he ends up he ends up when we find out later when she comes back home and she sees like you're gonna a, spoil this too i'm yes. gonna spoil, spoil this, this too. Skip ahead. she wow. comes back home in, in another scene and sees all this this like all these crazy dirty like he used 19 different plates and bowls and forks and spoons to eat a DiGiorno pizza somehow. It's so stupid. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so now Jenny goes to see Autumn again. She's at Autumn's house and she's watching Autumn eat her sad potatoes in silence. She's just like staring at Autumn. It's so weird. Why doesn't she eat with her? Why doesn't she normalize the situation a little bit? Hey, I brought us potatoes. Let's eat some potatoes together. So she force feeds her potatoes, stares at her while she eats them. And do you know what I noticed? No water, nothing to drink. Nope. Literally, she's trying to kill her with mashed potatoes. Just dry, it's a pile dry of potatoes. Mashed potatoes and nothing else. She might as well be doing like <laughs> airplane. It's so obnoxious. <laughs> and Autumn does this great like excuse for why she's not eating more. She's like, oh, I would totally eat more of these boiled potatoes you brought me, but I'm I'm dying. And that's really why. Yeah. And then she shames her again. Jenny shames her more about not calling. And Autumn's like, bro, because you're obnoxious now. Like, you used to be cool. Then you became this super Christy, like, proselytizing asshole. And I don't like you very much. And Jenny's like, hmm, really? <laughs> Right. Jen literally doesn't hear her. She's like, why did we stop being friends? This is the second scene in a row she asks that. And she's like, being a Christian made you shitty. And Jen's direct response to that is, yes, I am a better person now. And I was just like, whoa, not what she said. It's like, this is one of those perfect examples. And I know you guys do this all the time. I do this once a month. So I know that I've like, I've got some catch up to do, <laughs> but I feel like every time I watch one of these movies, I'm losing my mind and I'm I'm turning to my dog and being like, <laughs> they see it, right? They see it. Like they're fully aware of that like Jenny's the bad guy, right? Because they did that on purpose. They made her the bad guy. No. Nope. Autumn is clearly rational and normal and Jenny's horrible, mm. but they're 
but they don't see it that way. Autumn's dying of atheist blood cancer and she's evil. Checkmate. Is what's happening. Yeah. It's so weird. Like, how did they not see it? They're the ones who made it. <laughs> <laughs> right. And, and this is where Autumn questions Jenny's religion a little bit. She's like, look, I know your faith is real to you, but to me, you're an asshole. Can you see that? And Jenny's like, no, I can't. She's like, okay. Do you have any proof of the existence of God? And Jenny starts to reach for the Bible and she's like, shut the, the fuck up. Jenny, Jenny, Not in the Bible, you yourself. idiot. Yeah, it's the best. <laughs> Spider-Man comics aren't proof of Spider-Man. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> and she literally has to go like, can we talk about something else now? Please, literally, just something yeah. else. This is so painful for me. <laughs> Once the Bible is proof of God was ruled out, Jenny was like, you want to talk about sports? The Mets are doing bad this season. You're going to go to hell. <laughs> oh, yeah. And this is when they talk about this weird childhood memory. Of MacGuffin! Like, oh, this is the MacGuffin? Could not matter less. Yeah, this is one of several. It doesn't matter. Oh, okay. We will spend so much fucking time on this MacGuffin, right? Because <laughs> we're going to speed through it because it doesn't matter and who cares. But they will talk for genuinely 10 minutes about like, do you remember that we <laughs> had a treasure map and then my father, well, you know, my dad actually left that for us on purpose. Oh, well, too bad he's in hell. It seems like a nice thing of him to do. <laughs> Yeah, okay, okay. So in case anybody had no idea what Eli just said, <laughs> they're, they're reflecting on a childhood memory of having fool's gold that was planted when they were on a trip somewhere. Like they found fool's gold and it was really exciting because they thought they found real treasure. So then they buried it in their backyard and made a treasure map. And she reveals to Autumn, did you know my dad actually planted that fake gold like so that we would have fun on that trip because he was a really good guy. But he's in hell now. Yeah. What? I'm very confused about my plot. <laughs> very confusing. <laughs> like, what? What is happening? Also, just throwing this out there, they seem to indicate that they buried the treasure with the treasure map. Oh, but they didn't because later we see the treasure map. Later we see the treasure map. But she very yeah. clearly says in this scene that they buried the map with the treasure. Whoops. All right. Yeah, they didn't have the funds to go reshoot that. <laughs> Did they get confused about where the map and the treasure go separately? It would be how that normally happens. Yeah. They got confused about that. Apparently it happens. But then they forgot about this whole fucking thing regardless. So <laughs> it's fine. So, yeah, they fall asleep together, whatever. Later that night, Autumn's mom wakes up Jenny. Jenny goes home and she sees that Todd did not do the dishes. Right. And. Again, there's like so many pieces of kitchen stuff that he used to eat one freezer pizza. It's bananas. <laughs> it's insane. There's like seven pizza cutters, a soup pot. <laughs> Somehow he served himself with a ladle. So much. How did you use the fondue set? What would that, how would that fit in? He's so garbage. He's so garbage. And I want to be clear. This part of the movie is never resolved. Todd never says, like, I'm going to help out around more around the house or I'm going to. Nope. This is just Jenny supposed to be like, oh, first my friend is dying and now my boyfriend sucks. Yeah, she she finally she goes like, oh, he's horrible. So she starts to do the dishes and he like wakes up from the couch and she's like, you said you would do the dishes. And he's like, oh, I fell asleep. I didn't do the dishes. And she's like. What the fuck? Why didn't you do the dishes? And he's like, oh, you spent so much time with your dying friend. If you were here more, <laughs> twice. you could have done the dishes. You've seen Autumn <laughs> twice now. Oh, God. I'm the worst and you're even worse than me. Yeah. And did you guys notice that she has a big wooden carving of faith in front of the sink? Yeah. Also, she has a left-handed refrigerator for no reason. Oh, lefty open? It's lefty open on the, she has one of the old school white refrigerators where the freezer's on top and the fridge is on the bottom and they're there and you can hang the door either way, which makes sense if you have like a weird kitchen and it needs to lefty yeah, open, yeah. but it's in the middle. There's no reason for it to lefty open and they lefty open it. That's weird. Yeah. And she's got the I think so too. no fussing, no mussing, no back talking. <laughs> yeah. Now, see, here's the thing that I will say. People are often like, oh, is there anything about being religious you miss? And I will say decorating would be much easier if I was religious, right? Oh, yeah. You just go to Home Depot and grab those wooden signs off the wall, just fill a cart, and you got your decorations for the rest of your life. Faith, <laughs> joy, family, love. Yeah, so they're both the worst. The main character and Todd, the husband of the main character, horrible. Again, these are the protagonists yep. of the movie. Allegedly. Yeah. Asterisk. Yes, they are, though. The movie thinks so. So Jenny wakes up the next morning. 
and she's getting a call from her boss at hospice. She slept through two appointments with literal dying people. Her hospice appointments. <laughs> she's so bad. I feel like, look, I know that's a movie trope, and this movie was just going for like, oh no, I was out late that I missed work. But I feel like missing a hospice appointment is a really big deal. Because doesn't that mean like Mr. Schwartz was somewhere without his morphine being like, kill me, kill me. <laughs> I mean, it definitely means that she screwed some people over. And isn't she up for a promotion? This does not bode well for her. Yeah, horrible. I do want to clarify one thing that I feel like I shouldn't have to clarify, <laughs> especially not on a comedy podcast. I'm going to be earnest for one second. Go. It's very common and totally OK that when people are nearing the end of their life, that they are religious and that they want to talk about religion and that there are spiritual concerns. And really, they, there is such a thing as spiritual suffering. But usually they talk to their chaplains about that. And I see patients who are end of life and we do talk about religion quite a bit, but I don't tell them what I think or believe. I listen to them and I validate their viewpoints. So regardless of if they're atheist or Christian or Jewish or Buddhist or Hindu or whatever, I am there to support them through their process and journey, however it is for them, right? That's the right thing to do. Do. Right, but you can make a jerk off gesture occasionally, right? Like when they're like, I'm going to see <laughs> my, my children again. Like you're just like, oh, okay. All right. Relax. <laughs> you got a straight face at the whole time? Come on. I'm going to have a day for you. <laughs> oh my God. All right. <laughs> or like, are you ever like, really, you're going to heaven, Mitch? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. So yeah, she, she missed a couple of, of, very important, you know, appointments with people who are at the end of their life. Mm -hmm. She goes into the office and she's having a meeting with the boss. She's kind of getting yelled at for that. And the boss is like, hey, you did something you're definitely not allowed to do. Autumn very specifically refused to get any religion from us. We're assholes who offer that kind of aggressively. And she was like, right. no. So you can't then still do that. And Marilyn actually told us that you... You did that. Yeah. She didn't sign up for the salvation package, and it sounds like you're giving it away for free. Right. Yeah. We have morphine. That's the salvation. It's awesome. Just use that. But the boss is great here. She's like, hey, you know you can't just, like, take your fucking badge off and start proselytizing. And <laughs> Jen is like, no, no, because I wasn't wearing it, so it doesn't count. It was just, I was just a lady. I was just a lady. <laughs> and then when she tells her that Marilyn told on her, she's like, she's lying. And by the way, She's literally not lying. Yeah, she she told her exactly what she saw, which is the ethical and right thing to do because she's massively violating her medical ethic here. Like literally the boss is like Autumn refused spiritual care and then you turned around and forced spiritual care on her and you're not a chaplain. You're a nurse. Yep. Yeah. Nothing about this is okay. Yeah, and her literal response by the way is, "So I can't speak to my friend?" <laughs> Seriously, this conversation is people are allowed to die without being harassed by you. And the response is, no, they're not. Gaw, I'm in a snit. That's the movie. Yeah. That's the point of the movie. Just And no, they're not. Gaw, I'm in a snit is the good guy in the movie. It's the good guy who literally says, I wasn't forcing my beliefs on her. No, but yes, you were. Literally, yes. Exactly. She was literally going, I don't want to talk about this. I don't believe the same thing as you. I don't even like you as a person now, ever <laughs> since you became this way. And she's like, just read the Bible. Are just you sliding the Bible the closer Bible. to me? Are you sliding? You're pushing it into my face. It's literally touching my <laughs> cheek now. It's, poor it's pushing against <laughs> my face. I wasn't forcing my beliefs on her. I was using her dying moments as my chance to pitch her on my timeshare. It's totally <laughs> different. Those are different. Oh. This movie. Yep. She's like totally not vulnerable at all. Oh, yep. This is actually about me. How can nobody else see that? Horribly evil. And then that horribly evil quote protagonist, Jenny, goes to Marilyn's office now to yell at Marilyn for, you know, in her head, narking on her. But in reality... D telling the boss of the hospice that this is a huge violation happening that's horribly unethical. Yeah. I just want to clarify. She does first invite Marilyn outside as though to fight her. Am I wrong? She does. 
Justin Marilyn's like, you can just tell me right here in my office. I think she tries to get a fight going. <laughs> Honestly, if Marilyn had just kicked the shit out of Jenny, I would have been, so been like, Marilyn, you want to take this outside? And in the next scene, she's just in a cast talking to Autumn. So, anyways, um, the great thing about Jesus, my eye, I fell. I hit a door. Yeah. <laughs> my eye fell. This is where Jenny in a movie, we've just seen what happened a moment ago. In this movie, she's like, she tries to gaslight us, the audience. <laughs> she's like, so Marilyn, why did you lie and say I was proselytizing against Autumn's wishes? And <laughs> Marilyn's like, no, you you literally did that. And I'm pretty sure the audience just heard you admit that like 30 seconds ago in this movie. Yeah, she like looks into the camera like we're together on this, right? Like we like just Jim that. from the office. Right. Yeah. <laughs> she pulls out a copy of the script from her bag. I mean, it's right here on page 26. It's the same picture. See? Yeah. Where you give her yeah. a Bible. <laughs> <laughs> right. So like the end of this is supposed to be Jenny's clearly fired and Marilyn clearly gets the promotion, right? Like end of movie. Right. No, not at all. That's so not what but no. happened. But this is a Christian movie, so no. Yeah. So from there, we cut to the next day. Jenny and Todd are at their adoption timeshare presentation style meeting of, of some sort. I was confused by what adoption means based on this movie. <laughs> oh, there's also in between here, by the way, there is a weird flashback to the pool thing with yeah but yep. we don't we understand do get, it we do get oh the pool right flashback. there's the flashback too literally doesn't yeah, matter none Good of you point. wrote about it yeah. so clearly you were like yeah. i blinked and <laughs> that's deleted it happened. from my memory yeah <laughs> <laughs> but this this adoption timeshare again has nothing to do with the movie nothing matters at all but it's fucking fantastic because it's just this woman at the front of the movie being like all right everybody couple of clarifications one uh -huh. you cannot buy a baby two sorry can you buy a no sorry you just said it you just said it you go what was next two <laughs> two if your relationship sucks, you shouldn't do this. And when she says that part, <laughs> Jen and Todd look at each other like, oh, our relationship does suck. <laughs> it's so good. She might as well be like, if you're a shitty couple who argued yesterday about dishes and it was like a huge thing, you should leave right now. Raise your hand if that might describe you. You two should raise your hand. <laughs> right there. You should leave. It's so good. It's it's amazing how much she really does hit them over the head, too, with, like, adoption is not the same as buying a car. It's not a purchase because you can't purchase human <laughs> beings. You understand that, right? Because that would be slavery. Yep. That would be trafficking. You cannot own human beings. You get that, right? And they're, like, they're like checking their wallet. They're, like, yes. looking up their bank statement. Like, <laughs> Well, that's what's so amazing is that as she's doing it, there's an extra in the back who is obviously just told to be interested, but it really looks like that guy's like, oh, you, it is slavery. S <laughs> Sorry, can you spell slavery for me? Because I was under a misapprehension. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like this woman who ran the adoption thing was just mad at the movie and was like, no, I'm going to explain what fucking adoption is to this movie and this audience of people because they're insane. And she did it. Yeah, this is another example of like, they get it right because they're allowing this in their film. Yeah, and I don't, I don't think they did. I don't think they even noticed that this woman in real life described what adoption actually might be to the movie and the audience. But that's what happens. Ugh. So they walk out of this presentation and Todd is like, well, you know, maybe, maybe we're not ready for being parents. I don't know. If it's meant to be God will make a way, which is the answer to everything and also a great cliffhanger. So I guess that's the end of act two. <laughs> so let me give act three the hard sell. Is it meant to be? Will God make a way? Will God's way involve murdering a lady using blood cancer? Find out it's definitely yes to all those questions when we return for the big finale of Redemption Way. Razzle, razzle, mumble, grumble, razzle, hey, razzle, Eli, razzle. Y you doing pre-ad mumble grumbles about bicep curls? What's what's up? What's going on there? It's Kara. She got mad at me for making fun of her stupid old headphones. She turned all my clothes inside out and made me walk to Carvel ice cream and get her a rainbow cone with chocolate sprinkles. Okay, so now, now you're doing training, like, you're, getting you're buff, training. getting fit, okay. so I can show her who's boss by doing. Bicep curls? That's right. Getting the guns locked and loaded. Look, Eli, if you want to get into better shape, why don't you just try FitBod? What's FitBod? Great question. No matter your goals or experience level, FitBod finds your next best workout. No six-week plans, no shortcuts, no bullshit. So it's like an app that tells you how to work out? 
How does that work? FitBod's innovative algorithm learns your goals and experience levels, and then it crafts a personalized training regimen unique to you and your goals. Even if that goal is to fight off Emmy Award winner Cara Santa Maria? Uh, that's probably not specifically an option, but yeah, sure, something like that. FitBod's one-of-a-kind algorithm uses data to create a dynamic fitness plan just for you based on your personal goals, equipment, fitness level, and workout history. I like FitBod because I can get a workout in on the road, at the gym, or even at home. It makes working out easy and fun to do on my schedule. All right, Heath, I'm in. Where do I sign up? Build your fitness habit and become a better version of yourself with FitBod. Get 25% off your subscription or try out the app for free when you sign up now at fitbod.me slash gam. That's 25% off when you sign up today at fitbod.me slash gam. Thanks, Heath. I'll show her in her stupid headphones. What was that about my headphones? Nothing. Cone. Now. I'm going. I'm going. Rainbow sprinkles. Rainbow sprinkles. Yeah. Get me one too. Jenny, thanks so much for coming in. Uh, go ahead and close the door. Yes, boss. Okay. Yeah. So Jenny, there's no easy way to say this, but one of our staff saw you proselytizing to one of our patients. What? N no, I wasn't. I just gave her a Bible and told her about being saved. Uh, okay. Yeah. That's, that's what proselytizing is. You just described that word. So you work in hospice care and you represent this company. So you can't just take off your badge and start changing people's religion. You understand that, right? So you're saying I am fired for being a Christian? N nope. Nope. Not at all what I'm saying. Definitely not that at all. I'm saying you can't use your position of power and position of trust to push a personal religious agenda in that moment. So, like, I cannot speak to patients with no. my mouth. Okay. You want me to sew my mouth closed? Well, wow. Okay. You know what? Let's back up. Let's back up. I feel like you're uh, you're, you're losing the thread here. It, just repeat what I say here. You, can you repeat what I say? Sure. Okay. This notebook is green. That notebook is green. Great. Um, my hair is brown. Your hair is brown. Right. Preaching salvation at someone's deathbed is unprofessional. You're going to hunt me down like a circus bear for my innermost thoughts. Right, right, cool, yeah, we're done here. I'm not a circus bear. Yep, got it. <laughs> and we're back. And we haven't watched any death happen for like 10 minutes in the movie, so now we're back with Autumn literally watching her die more for a long time. Right, and again, Jenny is once again going to ask her how she is doing. How are you? First question, yep. Yeah, and at this point, she's actually doing, I think she's done some good study, and she's doing some pretty good death acting, I think. Yeah. She looks like she's huh. got muscle-wasting disease. She can't really breathe very readily. She's very weak, and she's sleeping most of the time. So, of course, what does Jenny do? Come annoy her. With, with more Bible shit, yes. Yeah. Yes, and by the way, the sicker that Autumn looks, the more visibly aroused Jenny is. Oh, yeah. Right? Autumn's like, I'm... Eh, eh, scared and Jenny's like yes I mean oh yeah yeah <laughs> Jesus it's my chance this is great right but because she had that fight with her boss this is the like scene of indecision and because it's terribly scripted instead of just like oh no I, I've been instructed not to talk to you about Jesus and that's hard for me but I'm gonna be here for you for my friend instead she's gonna do a fucking liar liar pen is blue moment where she's like uh, uh, can't see it I'm not allowed. <gasps> <gasps> okay. All, all I was rooting for at this moment was for Autumn to be like a secret shopper for hospice. Yeah. To like, <laughs> you know, like the equivalent of not asking for ID at TGI Fridays as a bartender is like, you know, illegally proselytizing to someone who specifically did not want that when you're a hospice employee. And I, want, I was hoping so bad that that was like, is that a real thing, by the way? Do you think they do like Probably sting operations not. like that? <laughs> but there should be because you're right. Like she is super scared. She's really vulnerable. This is like the most sensitive time in her life. And she's struggling to breathe. And Autumn's literally, or sorry, Jenny is literally like, Autumn, I need you to tell me a little bit more about why you're not Christian. Could yes. you just yes. say lots of words? I need you to, I really need you to, and I'm risking my job to be here because this is about me. Yes. <laughs> right. To be clear, she's sitting there quaking like she's trying not to shit her pants with yeah. her with her prophesization. Mm -hmm. And she's like, okay, do you have something to say? 
And Jenny's response to her dying friend is, oh, so now you want my advice? Oh, yeah, it's horrible. And Autumn, the whole time, this whole movie, Autumn has been owning her. She's had the best argument. She's like, you're not a good person. I'm the one who's dying. Stop being such a selfish horrible human being and jenny's like i don't see it i don't know i just don't see it like jesus is basking me in his warmth i don't know <laughs> yeah. what you're talking about <laughs> yeah but th- then she has a coughing fit so jenny again force her forces her to chug some water like her boss made her chug some oh, water <laughs> this scene it proves that she is actually not a real hospice nurse because <laughs> autumn's lying in bed struggling to breathe she starts to choke and cough And Jenny, instead of like making sure that she's, you know, needs to be aspirate, like that she's not aspirating, like trying to figure out what's going on, she runs to her, waterboards her, and then (laughs) scoops her up out of bed. This woman has no energy. Scoops her up out of bed and shoves her head out the window. I genuinely thought she was going to toss her out the window to be like, (laughs) nobody talks about Jesus like that. And just a fucking elbow drops her on the way down. It's the weird, and then she's like, I need more Ativan, bring me more Ativan. Like, it's the only drug she knows how to administer. Like, like everything is just anxiety. Like, there aren't actual meds to help her with her breathing problems. And so so it's just crazy, because mom comes in with the Ativan, because, of course, I guess mom's the nurse now. All Jenny can do is try, try and choke her friend to death. Mom comes in with the Ativan and, like, takes her back to bed. Because why did she pull her out of bed? Did she get the out worst. of bed and throw herself halfway out of the window? Yep. Yes, she did. She did. I will see you downstairs. I'm an awesome nurse. That was not me. I would never have done that. At this point in the movie, she's such a bad friend and nurse. I thought she was going to chug the Ativan when Mom brought it in. (laughs) Oh, thank you. Your daughter is being such a bitch. You cannot imagine how much I need this. (laughs) Yeah, so Jenny gives the Ativan and then she leaves the room. She goes downstairs and she starts praying for a second. She's like, Leaves and prays more for like the magic to happen instead of the medicine that she just administered, I guess. I don't oh, know. It's so weird. Yeah. And, and it's like, again, it's very about her. Like, we don't see what happens to Autumn because nobody gives a shit. Mm. It's like the writers of the movie were like, oh, this is Jenny's journey. This is about Jenny and the troubles she had. And and luckily, yeah. Autumn's mom agrees because she's like, hey, honey, enough about my daughter. She's upstairs screaming for help or something. I don't know. I wasn't really paying attention. <laughs> How are you handling all of this? Yeah. And then she like, she like, then proselytizes to Jenny's or to Autumn's mom. Like she is neither a psychologist nor a chaplain, but she is going off on these very like somehow I think I'm trained as a psychologist and a chaplain tangent. She's a nurse. And right now she's not even working as a nurse. She's her friend's friend. That's all she's supposed to be doing. But she's stepping out of her bounds of competence in the worst way. Like this movie should end with her getting her license revoked at minimum. Absolutely. Yeah. She she explains to the mom, she goes, no, 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 you don't understand. If a dying person is angry or anxious when they're dying, it's because they don't love Jesus enough. And I wrote in my notes, take notes, Kara. Okay. Yeah, Remember that's that literally for literally what she says to her mom. She's like, oh, this isn't physical suffering. This is spiritual suffering. You need to be better at recognizing that. Jesus is punishing her. Yeah. She needs to repent. That's what this is. Right. Yeah. And then... Again, the the fucking pièce de résistance of the scene <laughs> is she turns to the mom and she's like, "Hey, just so you know, your daughter's gonna die super soon." Yeah, like, she does say super, that. And the mom starts super crying. Soon. And the mom starts so crying. And she's like, "I did a good job." The <laughs> end of scene. Do you want some Ativan or prayer? <laughs> no, great. Do you want me to huck you out a yeah. window? <laughs> More would have been really me. funny if she starts to force feed her in the water. Right? Oh God, I'm running out of water here. <laughs> It's a handful of potatoes. Where did you get that? Gross. <laughs> yeah. So Jenny leaves. She drives away and she's having a sad drive and she pulls over during this sadness drive to a random parking lot so that she could pray because you need to park to pray. Is that what we learn here? Yep. She does it twice. She does it once in the parking lot and then once just on the side of the road. Yep. And can we talk about the parking? <laughs> sure. <laughs> Because if I had designed a movie as Revenge Against Ethan Wright, well, it would be the overhead view if we get of Jenny's parking job, which takes up, I kid you not, three fucking parkings. I don't know. It was almost geometrically impossible. It was like non-Euclidean how many spots she took up. 
<laughs> and we watch her do it too. So it's very clearly someone with my driving ability being like, okay, I just pull into this empty parking lot, one space. And she ends up like horizontally across nine spaces. <laughs> I hated it so much. <laughs> so much. Also, okay, I hated that, but I did enjoy this. They redeemed it a little bit. She parks and she's like, hey, God. Hey, God. <laughs> fuck, are you listening to me? And then <laughs> nothing happens and she drives away again. And I laughed yeah. a lot because nothing happened. Honestly, if she'd gotten plowed into by a truck full of Ativan at that point, this would have been my favorite <laughs> Christian movie. Oh, it's so bad. And then she's she's looking very goth. She's got like mascara running down her face. She's yeah. listening to generic Christian music. That's just ugh, horrible. It's so bad. My music note was bad music. That's all <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, but this is where we see the second black character in the whole movie. Do we? A baby. A in baby, the which she considers stealing. Oh, that's right. Yeah, she she looks at a baby and she's like, oh, maybe I could just yeah. take that. No. Yeah, no, there's no. like 1.1 1. 1 people of color in the movie by size. That has to be what they were implying, though, in this scene. She literally pulls up next to a car. The windows are down. There's a baby in the backseat looking at her like really vulnerable. And she's like, mm, baby. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> Give me that baby. What was that look on her face? That was fucking <laughs> creepy. I don't even know what they were trying to do. Avarice, Heath. That's avarice. Okay. <laughs> hunger. <laughs> avarice and hunger. That tracks. That does track. So Jenny finishes up her sadness montage and she goes to her mom's house and uh, apologizes. Yeah, this scene is not necessary. Like it was already established that dad was kind of not religious and that they don't know what happened to him, but that like she's sorry that she was mean at his wake. Oh, that's what she was apologizing for. She was yeah, mean at the wake. Yeah, it's an unnecessary okay. scene. Yeah, she, she's sorry she pointed out that dad is in hell. Yeah, yeah. And also mom from, you know, Minnesota, she literally says, I know. I know. <laughs> yeah. I know. Those are her only lines the whole scene. I know, Jenny. I know. <laughs> And they have this great moment. And I've actually had Christians do this with me because, and Keith, I don't know if you've gotten to do this yet. It's a treat. I recommend it. Now that my father is dead, when Christians like in person try to do that like really earnest thing about being saved, I tell them that my father was like this great person, my like personal hero, was a teacher, but that he was Jewish. And then I ask them if if they think he's burning in a lake of fire forever. <laughs> and they do the trick that this movie does, which is, I think maybe God got him at the last second. You know, like maybe real quiet. I think we should check out this ripcord. Poof. Yeah. Yeah. They literally say that, though. Yeah. Like, what happened to dad? Well, maybe then they, they he negotiated something in the last in the 11th hour. We don't know. We just got to believe that. Yeah, yeah. right. That's, yeah, they go to the they're like, yeah, he probably just, you know, had a really long talk with God and just bullshitted his way into heaven. That's probably what happened. It's fine. Yeah. Oh, and then the mom's like, after she says, I know so many times, she goes, oh, Jenny, I'm seeing a counselor now. And Jenny's like, good for you, with literally no insight or introspection. No insight, no follow-up. Like, nothing about, like, probably I should see a counselor because I am a massive narcissist. <laughs> <laughs> and, like, I clearly never dealt with my father's death. Oh. And I'm now trying to cope with it by, like, proselytizing to my dying friend. But mom's... Yeah. That's why she tells her, Kara. She's trying to hit that. She, she's like, oh, you know, Jenny, I'm seeing a counselor. And Jenny's <laughs> yeah. like, oh, that's good. You're a real bitch. Anyways, <laughs> yeah. she's like, oh, do you talk about me a lot in therapy? I bet you do. What do you say about me? <laughs> oh, and this is the scene where where mom offers a drink and Jenny's like, no. And mom pours yes! the glass of water anyway, because that's what a loving mom does. I was confused. What, what did this mean? Also, she doesn't ask her if she wants. She goes, are you thirsty? And she says, no, thank you. That's a weird thing to say. <laughs> like, she doesn't say, can I pour you a drink? She says, are you thirsty? No, thank you. No, that's, I just asked you, thirsty. <laughs> you don't, there's no thank you to that. <laughs> weird. Yeah, that's like using take care wrong at the end of the thing when it's the other, right. yeah, for sure. Or the U2 when the waiter says to enjoy your not, food. <laughs> Have a good right, yeah. rest of Have your shift. God yep. yeah. damn it. Have a good flight. You too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're coming with me. <laughs> All right. So none of that scene made any sense. Now we're back at the office and Jenny has a meeting with her boss. She doesn't have a meeting with her boss. Let's be clear. Her boss is meeting with Marilyn 
to talk about her potential promotion, and Jenny crashes Marilyn's interview. That's what happens. Yeah, no, she shows up and knocks on the door correct. just as Marilyn is finishing her promotion interview. And she's like, oh, I'm here now. It's about me again. Black lady, get out of the... Yeah. Hi, I'm here. Don't worry. Marilyn's only two thirds of an employee. I would like to officially resign. Three fifths. Three fifths. fifths. Yeah. Boss might as well be like, it's a white person asking a question. (laughs) What was that? Jenny? The worst. (laughs) Yeah. But the point is Jenny's trying to say like, oh, sorry for, you know, trying to change religions on the clock. I'm quitting now. So I'm technically off the clock and I'm going to change religions all the time. That's my solution to this. Yep. I don't get this at all. Like, why doesn't she just take a leave of absence? Or stop doing that. Well, yeah, there, I mean, but clearly she can't do that. Yeah, <laughs> and sure. then we wouldn't have a movie. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever watched someone terrible at their job quit, but we get that beautiful moment here in the movie. She's like, here's my letter of resignation. And her boss is just like, cool, thank you. Does it, does <laughs> oh, it, does it um, say I'm resigning? You don't have to like type out a letter. You can say, I don't have to read it. That's fine. You're bad at your job and <laughs> I'm glad you're going. <laughs> I, I don't know why I'm so hung up on this, but clearly her boss the whole time has been like, Jenny, you're clearly in bereavement. You should take leave. And she's like, no. And she's like, Jenny, you can't break the rules by proselytizing to a person in our hospice. No. And then Jenny's like, I love Jesus, so I'm quitting your stupid job. And she's like, I offered you to take leave. Like, you okay. could have just taken... Clearly, your friend your friend Autumn is dying in like three days. You don't. You just don't go to work for the next couple of weeks. That's all. Do you want some Ativan too? We, we have a lot of good <laughs> stuff back there. Oh, and then this. This is the worst part of the whole movie. You yes. Guys. This is my best worst right here. <laughs> it's yeah. best worst. This is my best worst. So Marilyn goes into the office. She just heard Jenny quit. And she's like, so do I get the promotion? She's like, no, <laughs> we're not doing a promotion <laughs> at all. No, we got rid of the position that you were automatically about to get because there was no other competition. That doesn't exist anymore, though. We just canceled it. Yeah, she literally is like, we we really looked at your application with a fine tooth comb and we think that you're just a little black for this role. <laughs> Seriously. So we're we're going to dissolve. And I don't get this. Like, is this weird white supremacist schadenfreude? Like, do the people who this movie is targeting watch the I, scene and go, <laughs> yeah, that's right. She doesn't get that promotion. I think some amount of the, the production team, yes, and some no, and they did. Like, the, the boss might as well take out, like, paint chips and like put them up to her on and be like <laughs> no not promotion material yeah, so sorry close, but position doesn't exist anymore it's so rough i think that they must have run this past the test audience and all the christians were like super into marilyn not getting what she wanted and they were like yeah they love the movie i guess they yeah. just really like that scene especially when cr- they they stood up and clapped <laughs> i don't know what happened we're keeping it right because it is not an accident that they made this character black and the only black woman in the entire movie right like this was intentional it's too stark of a contrast to everything else to to not <sighs> notice that, like the ridiculous yes I, I would agree. Somebody, at least one person involved in this production is aware of that enjoyed this crazy racism on purpose. Yes. Oh, so bad. And everybody else was like, well, just look the other way like we always do. Yep. Sure. Yikes. <laughs> so that happens. Good times. And Jenny's like happy about this for some reason. <laughs> like Jenny is so the worst. I think we know the reason. So yeah, <laughs> Jenny goes back to visit Autumn now and, uh, you know, she's off the clock for her job so she can do whatever she wants but the damnation clock is ticking so she's gotta inject that jesus oh and before she says literally anything else she's like just gotta tell you i quit my job Uh, by the way autumn in case you didn't already feel horrible enough i quit my job (laughs) so i can spend time proselytizing to you i hope you can carry that guilt on your shoulders you're the reason i quit my job this is all about me this is technically ethical now that i'm forcing this religion on you just so you know right yeah and she's like literally like through gasping breaths it's like why would you do that <laughs> that doesn't make any sense like you didn't have to quit your job she's like no i did you, you're dying and it's a huge burden on me so you know i quit my job so thanks yep just want you to know this is all your fault yep. anyways enough about you we're thinking about adopting and it's so expensive am i right <laughs> This is so weird. So first she says, okay, but I didn't come here to preach though. So don't worry. I'm not going to preach at you. And I wrote in my notes. All right, I'm setting the clock for five minutes. She has maximum (laughs) five minutes in this movie before she starts preaching again. Uh, We'll get there. It's less than five. And then she says, 
very awkwardly and I guess not realizing it, like, yeah, so uh, we're thinking about adopting a child for, you know, our upcoming long life together. Me and my husband. Yeah. And then Autumn's like, oh, you can't just have him the old fashioned way. <laughs> and Jenny's like, so hurt by this. She's like, oh, your dying mouth has <laughs> shamed me. I would slap you, but it would literally kill you. <laughs> yeah, so you'd better spend a few minutes groveling. Yeah, my mouth's dying. Your uterus is already dead. Whatever. Same thing. <laughs> <laughs> so rough. No big deal. You're the worst. If you think about it, not having children is a little like being dead already. Are you technically a woman at this point? <laughs> <laughs> Matt Gates doesn't think you Matt should Gates be is able pretty to vote. sure you shouldn't be allowed to vote now. Yeah. That's, that's canon of the United States history. They just they just stare at each other angrily in silence. It blacks out in the credits start. This would be my favorite movie. <laughs> yep. But this is when Autumn volunteers. Obviously, this is a movie they can put whatever they fucking want. Autumn's like, <coughs> I read your Bible. <coughs> it's beautiful. <coughs> And now, you know, Jenny didn't force it on her. Autumn read it because it was there and she loves it. Yeah. Because you know what people say when you give them a Bible and they actually read it for the first time? That was good. <laughs> <laughs> really enjoyed that read. Just one Christian movie. I want someone to be like, so I read that Bible. It's super boring. You know how boring that book is? That's crazy it's boring. Banana. It's just Also, there's no way that Autumn would have read a Bible in that state. No. Like she's so sick. She's so close to death. She's None of that. She's barely able to keep her eyes open. She's so tired. She probably didn't have the strength to hold that big stupid book up. No. And definitely didn't have the cognitive capacity. Like she's delirious at this point, yet she's reading the Bible cogently and like making notes in the margins. Yeah, absolutely not. As far as I know, I'm not dying of leukemia. And I've tried to read the Bible completely, quote, healthy. And no, it doesn't work <laughs> yeah. for me. It doesn't work right. for her. No, absolutely not. No. But so I, I enjoyed this moment, though. So Autumn is like, yeah, so I read the Bible. I kind of liked it. And Jenny tries to double down and be like, no, <laughs> what? You read? I mean, that's that's cool. Whatever. I'm, I'm not here to preach, though. So I'm just I'm just relaxed and hanging out. Matthew 625 says our lives on earth don't matter. <laughs> just so you know, I can highlight it for you specifically if you'd like me to highlight the page and flip to it. And I was like, yep. Two minutes. It was two minutes. I wrote down five minutes. That was literally two minutes in the movie later. <laughs> oh, and the way the scene ends is so good because she's like, okay, fine. At this point, I can't fight you anymore. I'm almost dead. I have no strength. Just tell me a little bit about why this God is good. And then they cut the scene because she has nothing to <laughs> say. Yes. I was so happy. Tell me why God is good. And it's like, <laughs> la, 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 montage of her singing smart words. <laughs> la, 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 la. Those are all really good arguments. La, 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 It might la. as well be Eli, like, saying an illegal violent crime thing in the middle of our... It was like, well... <laughs> and we're back to the next scene. It's so good. No answer to, tell me a little bit, you know, good stuff about that God of yours. Cut. Just like one thing, just one thing I can hold on to as I enter yeah. into death forever and never, and never come back. Oh, absolutely. I could have scarf. Are you, you <laughs> saying scarf because you have a scarf? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we cut to the next day because they couldn't think of anything to say other than the scarf she was looking at on her friend's head. <laughs> and Jenny's digging a ditch. Like we go straight to it's kind of like a smash cut to Jenny digging a ditch, and I was like, "Is that for Autumn?" What the you fuck actually is thought that? We all thought that was Autumn's <laughs> grave. I I was like, "I don't think you're allowed to bury your daughter in the backyard like a family <laughs> hamster." <laughs> no. Oh, it's so it's so clear. Like in the last scene, she held up the little crayon treasure map and was like, I'm going to find our treasure. When you have a dying person in one scene and a hole being dug in the next scene, <laughs> movie language means that person's dead. You're digging them a grave. Yes, absolutely. Yes. No. If you were a real dead person doctor, you would know because all agree. real dead person doctors dig the graves for their patients. It's actually a nice little ceremony. That's, That's real. So... So anyway, this whole scene could have been a montage, but it's not. No, <laughs> no, it's not. We get to watch a ditch being created in real, in real time. We get a water break. We watch a water break and then more digging. But she's not digging with a full-size shovel. It's like a weird, like, children's shovel. <laughs> yep. So it's really awkward. We get a under-boob sweat correction. Like, we watch her, like, pull out her sports bra and be like, eh, uncomfy. We yeah. also get to, 
<laughs> we get to watch her do that moment that happened to all of us when we decided to dig a hole as a kids where it's like, oh, this is going to be great. Shovel number one. Oh, this is going to be great. Shovel number two. Blah! Hard rock. Oh. <laughs> okay. Digging holes is... That's why they use the big machine. Why is my dad so mad at me now? I hit a rock. <laughs> what did I do? Right? He didn't know it was there either. It's fine. So we get more digging after that. It's forever. <laughs> it's so long. And then finally, a phone call happens. Marilyn is calling Jenny to say, hey, I'm, you know, the hospice nurse at Autumn's house. Autumn has finally passed away. Yeah. But apparently she just showed up to watch the the paramedics bring out the body in a body bag and it's a weird moment i do not know why they chose to do this as a movie but everyone just sort of stands there totally dead faced watching them load autumn into the car and when they close the door all the actors start sad acting like literally it's like <laughs> ka-chunk and they all like Bleh! but we watch them beforehand just being like oh it's a nice weather we're having you know so like sunny but what cool. kind of casters do you door have on that closes. thing yeah why <laughs> I think this is like the most realistic part of this movie. It's so part of our like gross, weird Western culture that the minute somebody dies, we got to get that corpse out quick. Yeah. Like they don't even wait for Jenny, her best friend who's been with her, you know, the whole time to like show up and say her goodbyes. They like zip it up. They call the second she's like, she's still warm and they call to get the body removed, which a lot of people do. And I think that's really weird and not healthy and not good for us. Like we should be mourning the death and allowing the body to stay with us and being close to the body. And this is why they're crying while it's getting loaded into the car. And they haven't before because they got her out so fast. They couldn't even mourn. Oh, they think it's just like demon meat now. We got to get rid of it. Yes. Speaking on behalf of the ignorant West, I think it's because most of us think bodies start to rot immediately after someone I know, dies. No, I know. They start to rot the, me the moment you get born. We're rotting the whole time. <laughs> But my concern would be like, oh, you can't leave her there all afternoon. She'll swell up like a bad bag of right. <laughs> meatballs you left in the back of the trunk. And a lot of people don't understand, like they don't understand property laws around bodies because bodies are quasi property. It's very complicated, but there's a wonderful woman named Caitlin Doty. If you've never read her books or watch her YouTube channel, she's a mortician who like teaches people about this stuff so that oh. they're not so confused. But you're right. Like That's good. a lot of people think that the same bacteria and germs that cause a body to decompose will like physically make you sick. So they think it's not healthy to be around a dead body, but that's not true. No. Also, they're probably overwhelmed by the urge to slap it. <laughs> only Eli Bosnick. Oh, it's just me? <laughs> the I'm Eli the only Bosnick one who story. goes to awake and is overwhelmed yes. with fear that you're going to slap the person in the open casket? Slap that corpse. Okay. That Eli I feel like story. I want to tickle it just in case it has a reaction. Exactly. Literally, I've been to two open casket wakes and the entire time my only thought has been don't hit the body. Don't run up there and slap the body. <laughs> so Do not run up there. Are you batting it. a thousand on not slapping no, the body? I, I am. I am so far batting a thousand on not slapping. Good job. I so did not think you. a thousand was going to be the number. Okay. <laughs> so that happens. Wait, 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 wait. This is my favorite part. This is my favorite part. So the corpse is coming out. She's in the body bag. They're loading her up in the hearse. Right. Jenny shows up just in time to watch that. The parents break down and start crying. Autumn's mom is hugging Autumn's dad. Right. Jenny's mom walks up behind them and just kind of keeps a distance, like a healthy, respectful distance because this is not her child who just died. Sure. But Jenny literally pries her way into their parent yep. hug. Did you guys see that? She like, yep. she like rips their arms apart and puts herself in between them like, okay, this is about like me again, grabbing right? grabbing hands to start a threesome. <laughs> yeah, she cuts in. Like it's a tango. Yes. Excuse me. Excuse me. I'm just really going through a lot right now. I know your daughter's dead, but I just really, this is hard for me. I need you to comfort me right now. Yeah. Please. If you could do that. Now we're at the funeral. We cut to the funeral where Jenny is giving the eulogy. No, no, no. Before this, something very important yeah. happens. She brings the fool's gold. No, not even that. Before that, she's in bed writing the eulogy. Yeah. Oh, and her okay. husband slides in next to her and is like, what you doing? And she's like, I'm <laughs> clearly writing my dead friend's eulogy. I hate you so much. Yeah. And then he's like, hmm, what's new in your life? And she's like, oh, I quit my job. And he's like, finally, like a proper Christian woman, you can stay home and make me pizza <laughs> and do the dishes. Our life is going to be awesome now. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> mm -hmm. That actually happened. Verbatim. Yep. Sure does. 
He's also very clearly trying to turn this into sexy time, right? Like he like <laughs> runs his fingers up her leg. Hey, what are you doing? Writing Autumn's eulogy. What kind of eulogy? I can't say sexy. I can't say I eulogy love sexy. eulogy. <laughs> <laughs> so all that happens. And now we're at the funeral where Jenny's going to give the eulogy. And you know, it's a great time to proselytize when somebody doesn't want it after they die. So that's what she's going to do. Oh, yeah. sure. They can't say anything about it. Mm-hmm. But of course, first she has to chuck the fucking fool's gold into the into the casket. The open casket. We're so weird. Why do we do open casket? Are you supposed to put stuff in the open casket like a fucking times capsule? Yeah, you can. You're not supposed to put stuff and you're not supposed to hit them. No, you can. You can bury things. You can hit put them. random stuff in there if you want. Of course, if you can't, you, you're, not if you're like a weird stranger, like you're not going to like chuck your empty Doritos bag in there. But yeah. <laughs> Actually, that's a great place to do it. Self-sealed <laughs> container. Better that than a dump. But like, I think that what's weirder is that we're a culture that dresses up dead bodies like they're not dead. Like they put her in the wig. They added a bunch of makeup. They made her look not sick so that people can look at her like a doll. It's yeah, that's super weird. weird. It's very weird. Jews don't do that. Fun fact. Yeah, because that's healthier. Open casket is not the thing. No, they put you in like a plain pine box and they're like, everybody back up. Right. And then the, the Shiva tradition makes a lot of sense to me, actually, in comparison. Yeah. At least. yeah. It's so and so here's the part where she's like putting the fool's gold in the casket. And then I think the mom comes up. And, and gives her the Bible that she had scribbled in and right. says, look, you actually affected her in her dying days. And she, like, <laughs> I guess was converted. And Jenny says this. You don't know how much I needed that. Yeah, me, 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 me. And, and by <laughs> the way, her friend did not write, like, I have accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Her friend basically wrote, have a nice summer in her Bible. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's so dumb. Like, Autumn's mom might as well come over and be like, I, the atheist mom, have a concession statement to make. This is <laughs> for you. I found that Bible. She loved it. It made her... Death from leukemia, so much better. No, the fuck it didn't. And then Jenny's like, my narcissism is so swole right now. <laughs> so swole, <laughs> turgid. My narcissism is turgid in this moment. Yes. And then she does the eulogy and oh my God, this eulogy, it's the worst. She literally begins it with, hey, everyone. <laughs> exact words. <laughs> I, I wrote in my notes, oh, I'm sorry. Did the person before her use what up, what up? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It's basically a podcast. It's awesome. Keep it going for the eulogy. Ooh, ooh. <laughs> whoop, yeah. whoop. <laughs> who's drinking? Have you ever had a smart friend whose maid of honor is an idiot and you don't know why, but they're allowed to give a speech at a wedding? It's yes. the eulogy version of that. <laughs> it's rough. Yes. Right? It's like, and now Karen's childhood best friend, Candace, who's wearing juicy sweatpants <laughs> at this wedding, <laughs> is going to come up and... Talk about stuff before her husband is escorted out by the cops. And by the way, this is not a gendered thing because this also happens when the groom's best man is a fucking moron. Absolutely <laughs> correct. And he gets up and makes a bunch of really off-color jokes about yeah. the groom's sexual proclivities. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Everyone has their own rule to play and the groom's <laughs> best man's job is always to be like, one time he cheated on her. Listen, yeah. I killed at that wedding, Kara. I told you that story in confidence. <laughs> <laughs> My set was amazing. Whatever. Kara, if you're asking us to be your co-maids of honor, oh, the answer is yes. <laughs> So anyway, Jenny's eulogy really drives home the point. Okay, Jenny's eulogy included her establishing for the fact that she's the best friend of the dead person during the eulogy. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Four Needs to do that. sentence. The first four sentences of the eulogy are entirely about Jenny. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Like, I'm her best friend. She might as well be like, looking at you, Megan, right there. <laughs> Me. Camera pans over to Megan. She's just shaking her yeah. head back and forth. <laughs> Literally, her entire eulogy is, I'm Jenny. I'm the best. And this movie's about me. And Autumn's entire existence served to make me a better Christian. That's we all it. get that, right? That's the whole that's, thing. That's this movie. She talks like that for a while. And then she finally realizes, like, I should probably say something about Autumn. Autumn was nice. She had, we were in uh, early 
Teeth? Yep. Who said teeth? That's a great one. Thanks. Just shut them out. If you think of them, I'm having trouble. <laughs> Who's drinking tonight? Yes, I'm drinking. <laughs> she had, and this is actually what she says. She had great fine motor skills. Oh, yeah, she does say <laughs> That's that. That's the comment for the dead person skills. for whom you are reading a eulogy. This is why you need your spouse to speak, because otherwise <laughs> Jen is up there talking about your fine motor skills. <laughs> Listen, my mom's going to outlive me and she's going to give a great eulogy. Yeah. I have a good plan. Yeah. Yeah. Otherwise, fucking Slotnick's going to get up there and be uh, like, I have some thoughts on the Federal Reserve. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like, honestly, the two of them who are both probably going to outlive me will have, they'll, they'll do a fun roast of me as a eulogy. <laughs> the two of them tandem. It'd be a good time. Eli, if you want to get on that, let's let's I'll let's, let's go Come ahead on. and pretend you're alive. We don't too. have to pretend yeah. that you're gonna, okay. Yeah, I, 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 I didn't. I, I didn't want to say, but yeah, okay. <laughs> Do you have a gun to your head? Because if you don't, I'm not going to outlive you. <laughs> Jesus Christ! <laughs> oh my God! So the next day, the eulogy's over. Jenny gets a call. This doesn't make any sense. This is the, okay. So the movie's over, but they decided to have one more scene for no reason. Jenny gets a call from a bank, and somebody left her some money, but it. It's not Autumn. It's her dad. Yeah, remember her dad who never went to heaven because he was a bad dude, but planted the fool's gold just to make her happy and then left her a shitload of money? That terrible dad. Oh, was that a metaphor? The fool's gold? This is real gold now. Oh. <laughs> yeah, because dad is a good guy. Yeah. What? Like, it's just like, again, they they see it, right? Like, they see the irony. I don't know. All I wrote was, I have no comment on this stupid coda this is an <laughs> unnecessary scene and i hate this movie i hate it but that's it that's the whole thing so they like go to the bank her and todd and they get money somehow and then, then i did enjoy this moment she's like so do i do we hug it out with the bank manager after we get the money <laughs> she, gives she, like very, a, she gives him like a tap tap hug like a yep. like an ass out hug she definitely goes for a christian camp side hug with the <laughs> bank manager and he's like, you, you don't have to do that. I work here. This is, this is weird. I have, to, I, I have to tell a lot of people this. We don't hug now. Yeah, I guess this. they literally wrote this scene to tie up the loose end of they're too poor for a baby. That's the point of the scene. Yep. Because while the Christian movie audience was cheering for the Maryland scene, the all of their hands were raised for like, but she didn't have no baby by the end. You got to fix that. <laughs> yeah, we need to get her into heaven. <laughs> Not going to happen without a baby. Nope. Okay. And that's, that's the end of the movie. Like I, yeah, I thought something else had to be about to happen, but no, that's it. Was there a moral of the story? Like, I felt like maybe the movie forgot to do their moral or did they think they did it? Was there a moral? Mm, racism. Yes. Marilyn. No. Hat. Scarf. Hat. Okay. <laughs> Make your spouse speak at your funeral. There you go. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> Unintended moral. <laughs> All right. I think that's going to do it for Redemption Way. But we did find another god awful movie for next week. So, Eli, what's on deck? We'll be watching Wednesday Morning Breakfast Club. It's the story of nicely describing old people, no matter how batshit or boring they happen to be. Yeah, that's very accurate. <laughs> so, with that to look forward to, we're going to bring episode 347 to a merciful close. As always, big thanks to Kara for joining us. Kara, anything coming up you wanted to announce or like any grand proclamations you want to make? Any indefensible hot takes? Anything Ooh. you want to toss in right now? Yeah, I'm sure you'd love that. I'm, I'm rocking my headphones right now. <laughs> <laughs> keep my head down. I'm going to keep working on this PhD. I got about a year left, so you can call me doctor soon, but not that kind of doctor. Okay. Get it through your skulls. Dentist. That kind of doctor. DDS. <laughs> Zach Morris headphones. Got it. PhD. D. <laughs> he did D, doctor, right? Isn't the D doctor? Yes, Pharmaceutical it is doctor, dentist. Yes. You can call me Dr. Santa Maria in about a year, but. Doctor of um, dental philosophy. No, because. Doctor cause they, of philosophy it's your in clinical, clinical psychology. That's the, the re answer, is that it's your son. Real doctor. You're the surgeon. And of course, big thanks to our <laughs> Patreon donors for all the generosity. <laughs> <laughs> if you'd like to help support the show, you can make a per episode donation at patreon.com slash godawful. And that'll get you early access to an ad-free version of every episode. You can also help us out by leaving us good reviews and by sharing the show on all your various social media platforms. And if you enjoyed this show, be sure to check out our sibling shows, The Scathing Atheist, Citation Needed, The Skeptocrat, and D&D Minus, 
Available in all the podcast places. I believe Citation Needed was mentioned in Good Housekeeping recently. It sure was. What? That's amazing. Top yep, 25, 25 comedy podcasts. Yep. Granted, 24 of 25, they but that's not the order. point. They were not in order. I think they were just random order, I'm pretty sure. They were in random order. Or they think we're funnier than Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me. Either way. <laughs> it's probably <laughs> both. What? If you have questions, comments, or cinematic suggestions, you can email godawfulmovies at gmail.com. Legal services for this podcast are provided by the law offices of P. Andrew Torres. Our theme song is written and performed by Ryan Slotnick of Evil Giraffes on Mars, who might do my eulogy. All of the music was written and performed by our audio engineer, Morgan Clark, and was used with permission. Thanks again for giving us a chunk of your life this week. For Kara Santa Maria and Eli Bosnick, I'm Heath Enright, promising to work hard to earn another chunk next week. Until then, we'll leave you with the Animal House close. Jenny and her creepy husband adopted the perfect accessory for her massive head, but then sometimes it <laughs> cried and shit. How could it do that to her? No fair. No fair. Leukemia kept on living its best life. Mm-hmm. Autumn burned in hell with Jenny's dad forever and ever for all eternity. <gasps> There's the moral. That's the moral. That's the moral. You got, it. you got it. Lake of Fire. Nailed it. Shittiest, you were like, you were like saying you were gonna count down. Three, two. It's too late now. It's too late. We're We're already recording. recording. Is everybody recording? Your cum is already all over our (laughs) Morgan. (laughs) What? (laughs) That's so gross. Premature. Jesus. Yes, that's what he's trying to say. Yeah. Sorry. Let's keep it professional. That's my my mistake. (laughs) (laughs) Correct. The preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm, LLC. Copyright 2022. All rights reserved. Henry and Joan were at the altar when Henry had cardiac arrest. Suma Health revived him, and 10 days later, Henry and Joan were married. In a hospital room, Suma Health, vital for care that never quits. Vital for life. Visit sumahealth.org slash heart. At Lakeside Book Company, we make the books that tell a story. Now, we'll make a career that is your story. Lakeside Book Company in Willard has positions available. Entry level, skilled, and salary positions in a growing, innovative company with opportunities for advancement. Get competitive wages, benefits that include medical, dental, vision, 401k, paid vacation, and more. Don't wait. Apply today at lakesidebookcompany.com slash Willard. Lakeside Book Company. Our books bind us. Our people make us.